Crow Country Weirdness by Connor P. I grew up spending the summers in Montana, and I still make it out there when possible. Something that's been drawing a lot of national attention lately is the disappearance of native women, especially in Crow Country, which expands far beyond the reaches of the actual Crow Indian Reservation. I first started hearing about these disappearances back in 2014, but every year, there are somehow hundreds of newly missing person cases reported in the region. Much of my family still lives in Montana and is plugged in with the local basketball community. If you don't know, high school basketball is extremely popular in Montana and many teams spend a lot of time traveling to and from games. My cousin recently spoke with someone who wished to remain anonymous from the Hardin basketball team. Hardin, Montana is on the border of the Crow Indian Reservation and that's where a lot of disappearances seem to happen. The following is from my cousin's telling of his native friend's account. We were on the bus traveling to Billings, Montana for an away game. We played a good game, but we lost 28 to 24 ultimately. We were on the bus back home to Hardin when we saw something running alongside the bus. It was dark, so I couldn't tell what it was, but I figured it was a stray dog or a coyote. When we got back to the high school, and I was getting into my truck when I saw something run out from behind the bus. There were still a few girls waiting to get picked up by their parents, so I grabbed my Ruger Blackhawk revolver from the glove compartment in a mag flashlight and started strolling to where I had seen the movement. I turned on the flashlight and looked around. I couldn't see anything at first, so I went back to my truck. The last girl's parents picked her up and I turned on my truck the high school backs up to some space off of North Mitchell Road, which I must take to get off home. It's nothing but trees in that area, it's basically just woods. I was flipping through radio stations to get the forecast because it was supposed to snow later that night. I happened to glance up and saw something running behind my truck in the rearview mirror. I quietly cussed myself before going to a gradual stop. Once again, I grabbed my revolver and flashlight and started to open the door when something slammed into the outside of the door, effectively boxing me in. What I saw next was the stuff of nightmares. A face was pressed up against my driver's side window, but it wasn't the face of a human or any animal I knew of. It had dark, short hair, big yellow eyes, and tiny black pupils. It had tall, pointy ears on the top of its head and long, sharp teeth hanging out from its mouth. Th these teeth, they were shaped oddly though, almost like shark teeth. Its snout almost reminded me that of a baboon. It was breathing on the window, causing it to fog up immensely. I was honestly stuck in a state of shock and for just a moment, I forgot that I was holding the revolver. Almost as soon as I did, I could see the eyes shift from looking down at the gun and then back up to me. What happened next? sends shivers down my spine, even retelling it. Its mouth twisted up in a cruel, gruesome smile. Before I could even raise my hand, it leapt back, ran away from the truck, and that's when I got a good look at the rest of its body. It was very tall, but it resembled that of a large dog of sorts with a thick, dark mane mixed with the body of a human. It had wide, muscular shoulders like a football player and arms that hung down way past its knees with knuckles that seemingly grit. With its knuckles touching the ground, it appeared to be crouching down, but even in the position it was in, it was still almost eye level with me in my cab of my Ford F-150. I was fearful that it might lunge at the truck again, so I shifted it into drive and began pulling forward. Instead of slamming back into the door, it jumped high into the air and landed on top of my truck denting the roof, before jumping off the other side and running off into the night. I swear I almost had a heart attack and crapped myself right there. I drove home the long way, frequently checking my mirrors to ensure it was not following me. His experience has left me extremely concerned for the safety of the people in my community. I can't help but wonder if that was a demon, or some sort of dogman, or something else. Maybe that's what's making these young women disappear. I'm sure that might be a stretch, but you never know.
Backwoods Georgia Camping Trip by ACDC Family. To start this story, my husband and I are dedicated outdoors people. We love being in nature and camping. We are also devoted hunters. We had some hunting property in good old Washington, Georgia, quite a few years back. It was all a hunter could ask for. Rabbits, raccoons, white-tailed deer, hogs, coyotes, everything you could think of. It was about 300 acres, which was more than enough room for us to explore, hunt, and camp. We would camp at a specific spot off of a dirt road deep into the thicket. After you went through the brush, it opened up into a giant area of oak trees. It was beautiful. At the time, we had a Subaru Outback with a rooftop tent, so it was easy to set up for the night. That area was tranquil. We had some other renters on the property, but we were pretty much the only ones in this area. They were all on the other side. They were very kind and respectful people, so we never really had to worry about them. Out there, when it gets dark, it gets very dark. There is zero light pollution out there, so if you don't have any lights, you're pretty much screwed. One night, my husband decided to go hunting at night for some reason. I believe he was trying to get some hogs. There was a tall box stand about a mile away from where we set up our camp, but I was never concerned about being left alone because we always carry a pistol on our side. You can never be too careful. So, we set up the tent. I got all comfortable inside, and before he went on his way, he gave me a walkie-talkie. Now, these were good walkies. They can go up to two miles in the signal. So, he started walking off into the night, and I could hear the crunching of leaves getting farther and farther away until I could hear it no more. Before I go to bed, I want to watch a couple of YouTube videos because I'm putting on an excellent old Swamp Dweller video to sleep to. A good 30 minutes to go by, and I start hearing leaves crunching. It's a good distance away from the car, so I try not to overthink it. Maybe it's just a deer looking to bed down for the night or something of the sort. You know, I can't freak out every time something happens. Animals do live their lives just like we do. Then, I can hear it slowly getting closer to the car. The steps sound slow, almost like it's trying to be quiet. I turned off my phone and just listen. I hear it start to circle the car. At first, I thought my husband had returned and he just didn't radio in to tell me he was here. I wasn't about to call out to whatever it was to let it know I was up, even though I had my pistol nearby. There are windows you can zip down in the tent, but even if I did, like I said, it's pitch black out here. I loaded my pistol and called, Honey, is that you? Whatever it was, it stopped moving, and then I heard the leaves crunching again, but like it was running away this time. Now I don't, I don't know at this point if it was just a deer that was curious or what. I told my husband what had just happened, but the signal didn't reach to him, it was just static. I tried not to overthink it at this point and just lay down and try to go to sleep. All of a sudden, out in the woods, I heard this sound that was god awful. It sounded like a pig squealing, but it was gargling at the same time. I knew damn well that was not a pig. I tried to call my husband on the phone, but the signal was not great, it was super patchy. I tried to radio him, but still static. At this point, my adrenaline started going. All I could think was, what the heck was that? At this point, I had my gun at the ready when I heard something sprinting toward the car again. I felt a big thud as it rammed into the vehicle. Then it starts doing that god-awful squeal again. I start thinking, please don't go for the ladder, please don't go for the ladder. And of course, it goes quiet again momentarily. And then, I hear this clinking noise. Crap, it's going up the ladder. I go towards the front of the tent where the zip-up cover is to go to the ladder, and I shoot aiming down at the ladder. I shot a couple of times, my heart pumping out of my chest. Then it lets out these screams even worse than the squeals. It sounds like it's something straight from hell. I heard it run off, and at this point I go to the middle of the tent and just have my pistol still aimed at the ladder. Then I hear something running towards the car again. Thinking that it's trying to kill me now, I hear my husband calling my name. I came down from the ladder, and I told him we have to go now. Without a second thought, we packed up the tent, got in the car, and sped out. As good as the hunting was and the fantastic memories that were made out there, I never went out there again, and I never want to go again.
Deathly Hiking Trail by Anonymous. To be truthful with you, Mr. Swamp Dweller, I have always loved hiking in the woods. The sound of crunching leaves and the scent of pine needles underfoot was one of my favorite things in the world. So, when I found myself on an unmarked trail, deep in the heart of the forest in a state park that I have gone to every single day of my life for the past two years, I was overjoyed. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and I was in my element. As I walked deeper into the woods, the light began to fade and the trees grew closer together. I found myself in a dark, dense thicket of underbrush, and I had only then realized I had lost my way. Suddenly, almost as if I'm in some sort of cliché horror movie, I heard a weird noise. It was strange, and it was an unearthly sound. But what made it even weirder was it wasn't coming from above or from around me. It was coming from underground. At first, I really did try to ignore it, telling myself it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. But the noise grew louder and more persistent, and I knew it was real. It was as if something was scraping against the earth, trying to claw its way to the surface. As I continued to walk, the noise grew louder and more insistent, until it was impossible to ignore. I could feel it in my body, as if it was making my heart pound even harder. I began to feel an overwhelming sense of dread come over me. My body was feeling tingly and strange. I knew I should turn back and head for the safety of my car, but my curiosity got the best of me, and like I said, I had no idea where the heck I was. For whatever reason, I followed the noise, which led me to a small clearing in the woods. In the center of the clearing was a small hole, about the size of a dinner plate. The noise was coming from the inside, and I couldn't help but lean in closer to try to hear it better. And that's when I saw it. Something was moving inside the hole, something dark and writhing, like a mass of black tentacles. It was as if the earth itself was alive and trying to swallow me whole. I stumbled back in horror, and the noise grew more loud and more frantic. I turned to run, but the forest had grown dark and twisted around me. The trees seemed to be closing in and blocking my path and trapping me in a maze of gnarled roots and twisted vines. I was clearly freaking out and having a panic attack. The noise grew louder still and I could hear something chasing me through the underbrush at this point. I just felt that my life was in my hands at this point, and if I did not run as fast as I could, I would be dead. My heart was pounding in my chest, my breath was coming in short gasp. At any moment I was scared that I would feel something hot and fetid breathing down my neck, and I knew that if I didn't escape now, it would be my end. After what felt like a miracle, I finally burst through the trees and stumbled out onto the road. I looked back, but the forest was oddly silent and still. Whatever had been chasing me was gone, and I was once again alone. But I knew that the woods would never be the same again. I knew that my love for hiking would never be there. Something dark and sinister was lurking beneath the earth, waiting to drag me down into the depth of its domain. And I knew that I could never, ever go back there. Not if I wanted to keep my sanity intact. Hi, Swamp Dweller. I've been listening to your stories for about a month now, and I want to say you are my favorite narrator I have encountered thus far. I always think the stories you tell are fascinating, and they've got me thinking about things that I experienced myself. I am 18 years old, and I live in the Netherlands, so do not expect a Bigfoot, Dogman, or any kind of cryptid story. The forests here are just way too small, and the population density is too high to have such creatures lurking about in the woods. But, as probably many of you know, that does not mean that weird things do not occur. With that having been said, let me tell my two stories that still make me ponder sometimes. When I was about 13 or 14 years old, a new kid joined my class and became a member of my group of friends who I still see regularly. I will call him Brent to make things easier. Brent lives at the border of the biggest patch of woods in the vicinity of my house, which has an area of about 35 square kilometers, or 13.6 square miles for the American folk. His family has a respectable piece of land for Dutch standards, and has an extra building on the land which is used for office and guest stuff. Next to his land was an abandoned property, 
which consisted of four small buildings, of which two were inaccessible. Well, Brent, my friends, and I, being young teens, often went to this property and hung about the place, smashing windows and blowing up toilets and other stuff with fireworks. This eventually grew out to us having a sleepover in the guest house about once a year, during which we would wait until midnight to venture out into those woods. The abandoned property, other towns or sometimes all of them until the sun came up. We would occasionally build and throw Molotov cocktails in the concrete shed of the abandoned property, set off heavy fireworks, and one time even blew up 15 liters of lighter fluid on the sandy plains of the woods. These woods were mainly coniferous, and, for whatever reason, sometimes had these sandy plains ranging from small to huge within them. We liked one plane because it was about three miles away from the house, and sand doesn't burn so we were confident enough to set up fireworks there and not cause a forest fire. This annual night got a name, which roughly translates to Chaos Night. Childish, I know. One chaos night, there were only three of us because the rest of the boys had family things to attend to, because it was roughly around Christmas and New Year's Eve. That night was freezing cold, and we went out to walk to the sandy plain in the woods about 5 a.m. I remember it being so cold that the light yellow sand of the plain was frozen and glistening under the sky. During the walk there, however, something strange happened. We were walking single file. Brent in the middle, another friend called Steve in the front, and me in the back. When we were almost at our destination, whilst we were talking, I heard the whispers or mumble of a woman, just about three to five yards away, directly to my right. Brent and I stopped dead in our tracks because we have never heard something like that before. Brent often walks his dogs in the late evenings through those woods, and I have had enough adventures out here with my grandpa at night in the forest to know the common sounds of the Dutch critters as well. Steve has trouble hearing higher pitched sounds and was a bit further away from where the sound came from, so he didn't notice it. But Brent spun around and we both looked at each other confirming that we both heard it. We stood there for a bit, told Steve what we were hearing, and I shined my flashlight in the direction of the sound but never saw anything. This made us shrug it off and continue our little adventure. This might not sound scary at all, but you have to take some facts into consideration. Animals of the woods are extremely shy here, and will run off if they hear you coming, and we were plenty loud. Also, the other animals that would be active on the ground at that time, and maybe would let us come that close would be a moose, or maybe a rat or something. But I can assure you this, this sounded way too human. Brent even agrees with me that it sounded like a woman. So, either there was someone hiding from us, or it was something else entirely. The thought of my experience and what it could have been still gives me chills to think about, especially now that I'm a firm believer of the unknown. My second story takes place at Brent's house. This was after our first night of chaos. My friends and I went out to the abandoned property to throw Molotovs again, because the night before was our first time doing a thing like that, and let's just say... A lot of the Molotovs failed. Earlier, I said that we would throw the Mollies in a concrete shed for safety reasons. Yes, we were scoundrels, and pretty stupid one. The shed was placed about 10 meters away from the other three buildings that were built in a sort of circle. So during the night, we had not gone to the three main buildings because the shed was the first thing you would encounter from the way that we had to come. Therefore. We discovered weird symbols painted in red all over the walls of the three main buildings the day after. There certainly was a theme going on because most of them depicted a triangle with an eye that shed a tear in it. The other symbols that were there kind of reminded me of those patterns in cornfields. Me and a friend, Vincent, went into the only main small house which was the only building besides the shed that was accessible. The rest had collapsed some years prior. We noticed that some furniture had been moved around, rather recently, and we were now able to climb up to the attic. Like I said, it was a small house, so we did just that. Vincent went first, and I followed. He found like this casing that you put on the ceiling to cover up your light bulb. I do not know what it is called, but it resembled a globe and it was white. 
He was also showing it to the rest of my friends through the broken window while jokingly shouting, I found the eye of the Illuminati, referring to the triangle eye symbols outside. While he was doing this, for some reason, I had to take a pee. So, I went pee into this hole that was going into the ground. When I was done, I walked further into the attic, which consisted of two rooms, one in the front in which we entered and where Vincent found that weird eye thing. The room in the back was dark and only had one tiny window that was about 8 inches by 8 inches. To my surprise, there was this little filthy window there, also, that resembled an eye within a triangle painted in red. When my eyes adjusted to the dark, I saw that there was a circle painted on the floor with small candles on the outline of it. In the middle of the circle was a self-made morning star on the ground. For those of you who do not know what a morning star is, it is a medieval weapon which consists of a handle with a chain on the far end of it and a ball with spikes protruding out of it. I picked up the weapon and brought it to the window where Vincent was still talking with my friends outside and immediately after I stuck my hand out of the window to show it to everybody, Vincent threw the eye high up in the air and it landed literally on one of the rocks, breaking it into a thousand pieces. Vincent's comedy act caused me and the boys to laugh and therefore we weren't that impressed by all of it. Sure, we were perplexed that something like that would even be there, but not necessarily terrified. After that we threw some mollies and took the Morning Star back to Brent's house where he stashed it somewhere. That abandoned property has since been demolished and other people have built their houses there and the Morning Star should still be somewhere in Brent's house, although I haven't seen it since that day. We still go into those woods at night sometimes, and we've had a couple of weird things happen again. If someone wants to know more or even see some pictures of the Morning Star and symbols, maybe I can send them in. Although these stories may not seem scary on their own, together these experiences creep the hell out of me and often make me wonder what was in those woods that night and who left that Morning Star there and why. If someone has a clue, please leave it in the comments. Thank you for listening and stay safe. Hi Swamp Dweller, I don't know if you'd be interested in a story from England. It's kind of long-winded, but it's a weird and scary experience that me and my partner will never forget. To set the scene, we live in a busy city in the South Midlands of England. We have a bully breed dog and take him out for walks in the surrounding parks and woods quite often. I'm quite into the paranormal and have experienced lots of things. My mom is a spiritual medium, so I guess it comes with the territory. My partner, however, is a science graduate and is a very everything-has-an-explanation sort of person. Anyway, on this day, we decided to go to a popular picnic park just on the outskirts of the city. It's almost always full of families, dog walkers, and picnickers. It was late spring, and the temperature was just starting to hit summer heat. It was a sunny day, not a cloud in the sky, and no wind. The park was full of the usual parents and kids with their families and dogs, old couples going for walks and the like. Here in England, bully breeds are still quite stigmatized and feared, so we usually avoid going where there are lots of people. Not that our dog is dangerous or anything, he's just overly friendly, and people freak out when he trots up to greet them. So we decided to go off the beaten track. To give you a rough idea, the park has a small lake in the center with paths and benches that surround it. Just off one of those paths are a few farmer's fields in a thick wooded area which snakes around into another path which eventually leads back to the park. We decided to go through the cattle gate, which leads up through the farmer's fields. It was so hot and beautiful that day that nothing spooky or creepy even crossed our minds. Even though you could no longer see anyone, you could still hear kids playing and dogs barking in the distance. As we came up to the wooded area, whilst still on the dirt path alongside it, I noticed a man walking through the thick brush. I thought it was weird because he was coming from the opposite end of the woods which literally leads to nothing. No houses or roads or anything of the likes. Just endless fields and woods. I just told myself, oh, he must be looking for his dog or something. My partner noticed him too and we shared a look to each other like, what a weirdo, and carried on walking. But I couldn't help but look at him. He looked so strange. It must have been close to 30 degrees and he was in a thick black hoodie, 
black trousers or sweats, he had longish dirty blonde hair, and maybe around our age, so mid-twenties. But what was more strange is he had a dazed sort of smile on his face and his head kind of tilted to one side. When he walked, he swayed from side to side slightly. I tried to push it to the back of my mind, telling myself that he was just a stoner or something looking for his dog. He wasn't calling or making noises to get a dog's attention or anything, which was even more strange to me. Anyway, I kept looking back over my shoulder. He was in the brush for a little while longer but then joined the path we were on and began walking our way. He must have been about 30 feet behind us. I noticed how tall he was now that we were on the same path and how broad he was. He must have been about 6 foot 9, closer to 7. He was huge, maybe 17 or 18 stone, so something like 240 to 250 pounds more or less. Around this point, we noticed everything was silent. There were no kids laughing, no indistinctive family chatter, no dogs barking, no birds tweeting, nothing. The only sound that I could discern was the sound of our footsteps in the wind. But there was no wind. It was roasting hot, not even a slight breeze yet. We could hear wind blowing through the trees. Even though the sun was beating down, it felt darker somehow. Like everything was, I don't know, desaturated. My partner started to freak out and strangely so did our dog. Now this really struck me as weird. Our boy's the kind of dog who would greet anyone, run up to them to play. But no, he wouldn't even look back at me or the man. My partner and dog started to speed up to get away from the wooded area. This weird behemoth of a man was in. I really started to freak out myself but don't want to upset my partner even further. So I kept my cool, quiet, and kept my pace. I looked over my shoulder again and he was closer, maybe 25 feet away. Now for a bit of context, as you exit the wooded area you come to a path which is surrounded on either side with tall thick bushes and it curves around widely to lead you back to the main park. The curve is so wide that you can see far ahead, but you can only see the bushes where it curves. Neither of the exits are in view. As we reach this path, I check again, and the guy is closer still. It's still silent. All I can hear is the faint wind sounds in our footsteps, but nothing from the man. He's smiling still in that dazed sort of way, and still is kind of swaying. Everything still felt weird and dull, and that's the only way I can describe it. I thought to myself, if this weird bloke is going to try something, I'm going to have to protect my partner. I'm only 5'8 myself, and not much of a fighter. So I grabbed my car keys and put them between my fingers in my pocket. If this dude wanted to try anything, I'd smash him in the face and leg it. I'm not fast either, but I convinced myself I'd be faster than him. I check over my shoulder again and he is still close. I start to hype myself up. He was coming, and I was ready. I realized I couldn't hear him at all though. He was probably about 15 feet behind me now. My partner and dog had literally hightailed it up the path, but why couldn't I hear any footsteps from him? Another quick glance and he was right behind me, five feet or so. This was it. If I was going to do anything, it had to be now. If I could keep the element of surprise on my side, I might be able to stand a chance and give us the opportunity to run. I swung around as quick as I could and went to shout out at him and swipe at him, but he was gone. There was nothing there. No man or no sign of him whatsoever. I paused and looked around. He couldn't have run back along the path. He couldn't be that quick. I would still be able to see him as the path winds around so widely he would still be in view. He couldn't have jumped through either side of the path into the rows of bushes as I would have heard it and seen the rustling of the bushes or the hole he would have made. He had simply vanished. I stayed there for a moment and only when I decided to walk on to check on my other half and the dog that I realized I could hear the park again. The wind noises had gone and the day returned to normal. The sunlight was no longer dull and everything seemed normal. I got shivers and ran to catch up. I asked my partner if they had seen him go anywhere but they didn't see anything. They just said he really freaked them out and they didn't want to be there anymore. I could see that they were really shaken up. The dog was back to normal though wagging his tail and wanting to play and explore. We decided to cut our walk short and drive home. 
After we got home, I rang my mom and told her all about it. She advised me to check reports for missing people or deaths related to that area, which I did and weirdly enough, lots of people have died there by suicide or overdoses, but none of the people I found online matched this description. I tried to forget about it and get back to normal life and all that. I was applying to go back to college at the time, so I didn't really need to be thinking about giant ghost men. After a few days, it had left our minds and we got back to normality. A few nights later, I wake up in the middle of the night and open my eyes. As they adjust to our darkness, I look up at the ceiling where the orange glow of the street lamp shines through our window, and my heart stops. He was there, stood over our bed. He was so tall with his head just below the ceiling light. He still had that weird, dazed smile, all lit up with the orange glow. I jump up and punch at him as hard as I can, but my fist doesn't meet anything, because there was nothing there. I turned on the light and looked around, found nothing. I absolutely ransacked the house and found not a single person. I've never seen him since, but after seeing him in our bedroom, our apartment felt horrid afterwards. It never felt homey or safe again, and we would hear horrible things. For example, at one point in the middle of the night, I heard my own voice call my partner's name from the other side of our bedroom. We heard walking in our attic, which was too low for people to walk in, and our pets would not sleep alone. They would always growl at corners of the house. We left that flat after a year or so of dealing with the weird ghostly experiences. My partner, of course, kept denying that it was a ghost. She just said that it couldn't be explained. Hello Swamp Dweller, I've sent in a few stories in the past, going under a different alias, speaking about my creepy experience with camping a few years ago. But around a week ago, I had another very strange thing happen to me. I'm 14 years old and from Belfast, Ireland. I go out a lot on nighttime walks with my friends, and most nights we only go on short ones. But this night we planned on doing something else. I met my friend on her street and then we went and picked up my other friend. For the story, I'll call one Katie and the other one Ellie. We walked to the bus stop closest to my friend's street and got a bus to the university area of my city. As there are lots of cafes and restaurants around there, and it's quite bright. We got off the bus at the stop and started walking, looking for a cafe to go into, but we couldn't find one, so we decided to walk straight into the city center, which was a short walk away. We found an open cafe and decided to go in for a snack and something to drink. It was around 7pm and it was getting dark outside, so we decided to leave the cafe and get another bus back home. We got on the bus that would take all three of us home, but at the second stop a ticket inspector got on and kicked us off the bus when he realized we had no tickets. It was now raining slightly. We decided we would just walk to another bus stop and get on a bus that we knew would be inspector free. We walked around 5 minutes to get to that bus stop, and when we got there, there wasn't another one around for about 20 minutes. Damn it, let's just take the other bus to the field and then walk through it to get home, I said to both of my friends. They agreed, so we hopped on the bus and took a seat. On the bus ride back, it started to rain even heavier. When we got to the last stop, we were the last ones on the bus, and the stop happened to be in a very Protestant area, so we already felt quite unsafe being there as two out of three of us had very unique Catholic names and were afraid of some people hearing them and potentially harming us. I know it might sound a little weird to mention this, but unfortunately it is a true issue in the area we grew up in. We walked through some streets and finally got to the football field that backed onto the forest that we would need to cut through to get home. We sprinted across the football field, trying not to get our shoes too wet as it had been raining for a few days and the field happened to be quite flooded. We got to the edge of the forest, and when the rain got a little bit heavier than it was before, the forest was pitch black, so we turned on our flashlights to see where we were going. We began our walk into the forest, taking careful steps as to not slip on the wet, muddy ground. Now I spent my whole summer in that forest, and I would be confident in saying that I knew it like the back of my hand. All three of us do. When you walk in, there's a straight path that leads you through two small fence posts, after walking for about two minutes. When you get past those fence posts, you take a right and walk for about two minutes. Then you arrive at the other side of the forest, 
where you exit into a huge field, which then leads you home. Although, when we took a right at the two tall fence posts, it didn't lead us there at all. The whole forest changed shape. We had been walking down this path for around five minutes now, and the rain was so loud we could hardly hear each other. This was when we started to panic. We were running around now, trying desperately to find the way out of this place. We walked up a small hill to a big tree, a tree that we had never seen before, a tree that was not there before, ever. I looked around to see my friend Katie as pale as I had ever seen her before. What do we do now? She screamed. I shouted back to her that I didn't know. Then her flashlight flickered. An iPhone flashlight. Phone flashlights never do that. Then, mine went out. I started to panic as it was now so dark you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. Then, just after that happened, my friend Katie got a call from my friend Ellie's twin sister, who happened to not be there that night. Katie spoke to her in a panic, but this only lasted a few seconds as her phone randomly hung up on her. Out of the blue, it hung up all by itself and died. Weird. It was fully charged. We continued our walkthrough, still trying to find our way back. After taking multiple turns that we had never seen before, we finally reached the clearing that we had been looking for. It felt like hours of walking, and there's no telling how long it actually took. We stopped for a minute or two to calm down, when, from behind us, I heard twigs cracking, almost as if there was someone walking in circles around us. I told my friends we had to leave immediately, trying not to panic them. We got to the bottom of the field we had ended up in, and I checked the time. It was 8.45, but we arrived at the start of the forest at 8.39. There is not a chance in hell that that whole thing only lasted for five minutes. It felt like all three of us had been there for an hour minimum, but it was only five or six minutes. I got home and couldn't stop shaking the entire night. What just happened? Why did it feel like such a long time? Why did the flashlights flicker and then go out? Why did the forest change shape completely? Why did my friend's phone hang up? And lastly, why did I hear someone circling us in the clearing? We have all agreed to never go there in the dark, unless we are with a large group of people. If anyone has any idea what this could have been, or what we could have experienced, please feel free to inform us in the comments down below. The Camp Stalker by Ian F. This is no story. It's no tall tale or campfire speech to scare little kids. It probably doesn't sound terrifying like some of the other stories on this channel, but when you are in this situation, this will make your heart run cold, hair stick up, and eyes widen. It will change your mind about scary stories in general. I was camping with a group near Flaming Gorge, Utah. We had just rafted the Green River and had a great day in the sun. The group I was in comprised of about 9 or 10 teenagers from the ages of 14 to 18. Me, Max, an athletic, muscular monster, Caden, Jimmy, Ezra, Dax, Garrig, Kingston, Boston, and Isaiah. There were also three adults with us, family, and friends. We were telling scary stories around a campfire. It was only me, Max, Garrig, Jimmy, Ezra, Caden, and Dax. Isaiah was talking with people in other groups and Kingston and Boston were down at different campsites roasting marshmallows. It was a fun night, and our phones only said there was 3% moonlight this night, so it was pretty dark. We were all talking when my tent shook for a split second. We walked over to inspect it, and there was nothing. No one was inside, no one around. We all had flashlights and looked for about five minutes in the sparse woods and rocky boulders for people. No one was there. We found a rock, though right by the tent. Assuming someone had thrown it, and that's what made it shake, we calmed down, and we probably just forgot about it. It began to drizzle rain for about three or four minutes, killing off the fire. I went with two others to get some wood from the trees. We all had saws and knives to cut branches. We had lighters too, and flashlights. We didn't go too far, but it was dark enough to see the fire just barely. There was only a faint glow. We saw something move, not too fast and not too slow, but a silent shuffle a few steps and it stopped. It was pitch black, 
but from the glow of the fire and our lights, we could tell it was watching the fire pit. It was close to the hole, but not close to us. We ran back and yelled and pointed, but there was nothing there when everybody went to look. We were told it was our imagination. The adults went to their tents after stopping in to say hello. After a few moments, we sat silent, listening for the thing to return. Dax wouldn't stop talking, but at least we got him to whisper. Angered, one of the adults came out of his tent, asking which one of us scratched at his tent. He told us he was tired and wanted to get some sleep, and that if he caught us, he wouldn't let us have breakfast in the morning. We were all pretty shook by that, because obviously, everybody wanted breakfast. Something was wrong, though. Kingston and Boston came back, and we told them what happened. They asked us if we were being serious, and we put it on the boys that we were. They said they saw and heard nothing. We figured it was Isaiah, recruiting people in other camps to come scare us. But he was down at the opposite end of the campsite where we saw the figure. Would they go up and around through the trees just so they could scare us? I, I don't know. Things continued to happen, though. We heard branches snapping, but every time we looked, nothing was there. We sent many search parties up through the trees, and nothing was ever seen or heard. Finally, we all teamed up, Isaiah finally came back, and the same thing began to happen. We explained, and he denied that he heard or saw anything and that he had nothing to do with it. No one else was there to do it. It wasn't someone in our group at this point. I, Kingston, and Boston went to our tents, shaken and scared. We tried to cheer each other up by watching memes and funny stuff on our phone, but nothing worked. Then all the others screamed. If you get Caden and Max to call, crap is serious. They all dived into our tent. We asked what had happened, and they said they had gone looking for this thing once more. Now, they were just mad. They wanted to get sleep and were being kept up by something. But as they were looking, they saw a shadow move, and it was not theirs. It was like the dark itself had moved. Max was using his phone light and was filming for Snapchat to keep his friends at home posted. They heard a whistling when they were out there after seeing the shadow. They showed it to us on video. It was a long, high-pitched creepy whistle. The last thing in the video was them jumping in the tent, zipping up the zipper, and you could pause the video in the previous two seconds and see that right before the zipper was done, near the fire pits, you could make out two eyes and a smile in the dark. Those creepy long smiles with two big teeth are not the ones that I typically like to hear in a horror story. But this was, this was, this was real. It was, it was right there in front of us. It was sinister, crooked, and had sharp teeth. We don't like to go camping anymore. It's too reminiscent. Sometimes we still camp together, and we swear we can still see the tall, disturbing, omnipresent smile, shadowed by the trees, grinning at us. Nicolette National Forest Terror by Luke 8. A little background before we begin. Everyone says the same thing. I'm an avid outdoorsman. I hunt, fish, camp, hike, and kayak. My buddy is not an outdoorsman. He goes party camping with me, and that's about it. We have never experienced anything like what I'm about to tell you. This happened in 2018. The day before, we were camping at a lake in the Nicolette National Forest in northern Wisconsin. The trees were changing color at the time and the leaves were starting to fall. It was freezing at night, being October. My buddy got cold quickly and drove around in the mornings to warm up. We would go into town to get gas and supplies, mainly beer. There needed to be more to do at our campground, and with no hiking or activities, day drinking is kind of what we relied on listening to music and talking about party camping. The next day was going to be an overcast, rainy day, so we decided to spend it by driving around, looking at other campgrounds and scouting them out for other trips. We quote unquote partied that night and went to bed late. Everything was normal. We heard wolves, owls, loons, and all the other good stuff. But after a while, we heard nothing, just pure quiet. It was peaceful. It started raining early the next day. Just a drizzle at first, but enough to make camping a pain. We got up late, hung over and cold. We dressed in our hiking gear and jumped in the car to get warm. 
We left the lake campsite a little after noon to check out the other campgrounds. It was about five miles to the next one and basically on the highway without privacy. We would generally check them out, but it started raining very hard. We stayed in the car, marking down the campsites we liked and the ones we didn't. This one we didn't really particularly like. Now the thing about this national forest is there are campsites and campgrounds spread out absolutely everywhere. They need to be connected in some sort of way. So you have to get on the highway, find a little sign that says campsites this way, and then drive down a dirt road for 10 to 15 minutes to find them. We made it to about eight before five o'clock. We were at the entrance of what was going to be our last one for the day. It said the road was 15 miles. I went slowly, not trying to kick too many rocks up into my car. The road was honestly pretty eerie. The trees made the street look like we were going down a cave. A couple of minutes in and the rain had stopped. At the campsites, there was no one there. It was beginning to get dark. We had been in the car all day and we were ready to get out and stretch our legs. We parked at the first campsite and got out. The birds were singing their lullabies and everything was still. There were five campsites in a circular clearing with thick trees all around. The sites were open to each other and could have been better for my camping. Only if you rented all the sites. Honestly, we walked around the circle and noticed a sign that said group camp pointing up a trail. We started down the gravel path full of wet leaves to the site. After walking for some time, I realized it wasn't even close. I raised this concern with my buddy, but we wanted to see the site anyway. It was almost dark out, but we could still see rather well. I noticed the birds had stopped singing at this point. It was a hushed tone in the forest. All we heard was our own footsteps. We made it to the group site after walking for quite a few minutes. It was still and nothing was moving. We were at the end of the trail looking into the area. The hair on the back of my neck started to stand up and my skin crawled. Standing about 30 feet to our left was a very massive, dark haired creature. I was frozen with fear. My buddy hadn't noticed it yet and was still walking. I said his name quietly. He must have known something was wrong because he stopped and turned to his left immediately. We were both frozen. I was standing there what felt like minutes, but it couldn't have been more than a few seconds. I knew what it was, but uh, in my head I was saying they weren't real. I couldn't even speak. Then it started slowly moving towards us. It started yelling some deep throaty gibberish at us. Against all my instincts to hold my ground and fight back, we ran for it. It ran with us, and it was still screaming. We kept running for our lives. It was running parallel to us. Its scream was replaced by what I can only describe as a deep, throaty huffing noise. It was crashing through the dead brush, keeping up with us effortlessly. We were running, trying not to slip on the leaves or, or just die. We saw the car and had hope. As soon as we got to the clearing, it stopped. It hit a tree, more like it punched through a tree. We heard a huge crack and crash. We were almost to the car when this massive tree hit the ground next to us. We then listened to what can only be described as a great ape beating its chest in triumph while screaming. We jumped in the car and sped away. The rest was a blur. We got back to the campground, packed up and left at night. We never spoke about it again and haven't talked about it since. I'm almost entirely possible what we experienced that day was a Bigfoot. Camping in the Aztec Ruins Gone Wrong by Anonymous I had always been fascinated by the ancient Aztec civilization, so when my friend suggested we go camping near some ruins, I eagerly agreed. We set up our tents at the edge of a dense forest and hiked to the site of the ruins. They crumbled pyramids and ancient carvings that were awe-inspiring, but they had this eerie finger that seemingly lingered. As night fell, we built a fire and roasted marshmallows and made s'mores. We laughed and shared stories, but I couldn't shake that feeling that we were being watched. A chill ran down my spine as I heard strange noises coming from just beyond the tree line. My friends dismissed it as just animals, but I knew better. I decided to take a walk around the ruins to clear my head. The moon cast a pale light on the stone walls and carvings. Suddenly, I saw a figure moving in the shadows. It was a woman, dressed in traditional Aztec attire. 
she glided towards me, her eyes glowing in the darkness. I froze in fear, unable to move as she drew closer. The woman reached out a hand, her long nails sharp and menacing. I screamed and turned to run, but she seemingly caught me in her grip-like vice. I struggled and fought, but she was too strong. She whispered in my ear in a language I didn't understand, her breath cold and fetid. Knowing I would die, I could feel her cold lips on my neck. Suddenly, as if a, something were answering the prayers of a god, my friends appeared, shouting and waving their flashlights. The woman released me and disappeared into the shadows. My friends were baffled by what had happened, but I knew it was a ghostly encounter of some sort. We packed our camp and left the ruins immediately in the morning, vowing never to return. From that night on, I never doubted the existence of the supernatural. I can't help but wonder, though, what the heck did I run into? Camping in Sasquatch Country by Big John 6771. It was supposed to be the trip of a lifetime, a chance to disconnect from the world and reconnect with nature in the Alaskan wilderness. But as night fell and the campfire flickered, my friends realized they were not alone. At first, it was just strange noises in the woods, rustling leaves and snapping branches. But then they saw a massive creature looming on the edge of the clearing. Its eyes glowed in the firelight, and its breath came in heavy, guttural grunts. One of the campers grabbed their camera, eager to try to catch a glimpse of whatever this was. But as they approached, the creature let out a terrifying roar, sending them running back to the safety of their fire, or the perceived safety of the fire, that is. For hours, they listened to the Sasquatch circle their campsite, taunting them with eerie howls and bone-chilling screams. It was as if the creature was toying with them, enjoying their fear. As the night wore on, the campers grew more and more desperate. They had no weapons, no way to defend themselves against the powerful Sasquatch, and as dawn approached, they realized they might never leave the wilderness alive. But just as all hope seemed lost, the Sasquatch disappeared into the woods abruptly, leaving the group of friends shaken and terrified. They packed their campsite quickly and hiked out of the wilderness, vowing to never return to that cursed place again. Years later, they still tell the tale of their encounter with the Alaskan Sasquatch, a cautionary reminder of the dangers that lurk in the untamed wilderness. And whenever they hear a strange noise in the night, they can't help but wonder if the Sasquatch has returned to taunt them once again. I'll Never Camp in Yellowstone Ever Again by Adventurous Mark 45 Personally, I've always loved camping, and Yellowstone National Park has been on my bucket list for many years. The thought of experiencing the park's stunning natural beauty up close and personal had always excited me, but little did I know that my camping trip to Yellowstone would be a horrific nightmare I would never, ever have the chance to forget. My friend and I arrived at the park and set up our tent at a campsite deep in the woods. It was the perfect spot, really, away from the hustle and bustle of other campers, and we were thrilled to be surrounded by the tranquility of nature. The first few days were everything we had honestly hoped it would be. We hiked through the forest, spotted wildlife, and enjoyed the park's scenic views. But things started to turn dark on the third day of our trip. We were on a hike when we heard strange noises from the woods. At first, we assumed it was just the wildlife, but as the noises grew louder and we realized something was not quite right, a low guttural growl made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. We tried to ignore it and continued on our hike, but the growling followed us. Finally, we started to feel like we were being watched, and the hairs on our arms stood on end. That's when we saw a dark, shadowy figure lurking in the woods. It was too far away to make out any specific features, but we could tell it was massive and not of this world. As we returned to our campsite, the growling continued to follow us. We tried to keep our cool, but the fear was too much. When we finally returned to our tent, we locked ourselves inside and tried to ignore the growling outside. The night was long and terrifying. We could hear the creature outside scratching at our tent and making horrible sounds that filled us with absolute dread. After that, we barely slept, and when we did, it was fitful and filled with nightmares. When morning finally came, we packed our campsite as quickly as we could and left the park without ever looking back. To this very day, I really don't know what that creature was, but I have a very strong feeling that it was something beyond human understanding. The memory of that camping trip still haunts me, and I know I'll never be able to forget the horror of what happened in Yellowstone National Park. 
but please don't let that deter you from visiting. Overall, it still was a very, very serene place. We accidentally discovered a lost tribe by Anonymous Possum. It would be a fun and exciting experience to go camping in the Bolivian wilderness with my friends, I thought. So we packed our bags and embarked on our journey, excited to explore the vast expanse of unspoiled nature. The first few days were actually quite amazing. We hiked through the dense jungle, crossed raging rivers, and climbed towering peaks. We even caught glimpses of exotic wildlife like jaguars and tapirs. But things quickly started to take a turn for the absolute worst. One night, while sitting around the campfire, we heard strange noises from the forest. At first, we thought it was just some animal, but the sounds became more and more human-like. We were all on edge, but we decided to ignore it and tried just to go to sleep. The following day, we woke up to find that some of our supplies were missing. We assumed it was just some animal that had taken them, but we were all so wrong. As we continued our journey, we saw signs of human activity. We found footprints, broken twigs, and even discarded clothing. We tried to rationalize it by telling ourselves that some local tribes people were curious about us, but we couldn't shake the feeling that something was just not quite right. As we continued to hike, the feeling of being watched grew more robust. Then finally we started to see figures lurking in the shadows, and they would disappear every time we turned around. We were absolutely terrified at this point, but we didn't want to give up on our adventure. That was until an unknown tribe confronted us. Now, I had done quite a bit of research and had not heard anything about a specific tribe being uncontacted in this area, but I had read that it was possible that they could exist. They were a fierce looking group dressed in rough animal skins and carrying crude weapons. They didn't speak our language and we couldn't understand theirs. They made it clear that they didn't want us there and we knew we had to leave before things worsened. But before we could go, they attacked us. We tried to fight back. But they outnumbered us by far and had the advantage of knowing the terrain. Finally, we were forced to flee, abandoning our supplies and running for our lives. We were lost and alone in the wilderness, with no way to communicate with the outside world. Days passed and we ran out of food and water. We were exhausted and on the verge of giving up, but we refused to let these unknown tribes people defeat us. We finally managed to find our way back to civilization, but the memories of that terrifying trip have stayed with us for years. I still have scars from the cuts and bruises that I gained from all the plants and falling while trying to run. We avoided many traps and all kinds of crazy contraptions that they had put out there in the woods for what I assume is protection and potentially hunting. Now, whenever I hear strange noises in the forest, I remember that camping trip and shudder at the thought of what could have happened to us. I know that the story was short, but I had to share it. It's one of those things that just haunts me every single night of my life and it would be nice to have some sort of therapeutic escape. My Appalachian Trail Horror Story by N.A. Hiker 95 I never thought my hike along the Appalachian Trail would lead me to one of the most horrifying experiences of my entire life. Nevertheless, my girlfriend and I, who had always been avid hikers, decided to tackle the trail for our anniversary. After hiking for some hours, we decided to finally make camp for the night. We found a perfect spot overlooking the mountain range and quickly set up our tent. As the sun set, we sat around the campfire sharing stories and roasting marshmallows and making some hot dogs. Then, suddenly, we heard a rustling sound in the woods. At first we assumed it was just an animal of some sort, but as the noise grew louder we became uneasy. Then we heard a sound that chilled us to the bone. A low guttural growl that seemed to be coming from all around us. We quickly doused the fire and retreated to our tent. We tried to convince ourselves it was just a bear, but we both knew something was just quite not right here in this situation. Now we are experienced hikers and campers, so this was strange to us to not recognize these noises. We lay in the darkness, listening intently to the growling sounds growing louder and more intense. Then suddenly the tent began to shake violently and we could hear scratching sounds on the fabric. In sheer terror, we realized that whatever was outside was trying to get in. My girlfriend and I clung to each other, paralyzed with fear. My girlfriend and I clung to each other, paralyzed with fear, not knowing what to do as we heard the sound of claws shredding through the tent. 
We could hear heavy breathing and growling from whatever was outside. We knew that we were not going to make it out of this alive, so we started saying we loved each other. Just when we thought all hope was done, the tent ripped open and we saw the terrifying sight. A vast creature covered in fur and razor sharp teeth stood before us. It was like nothing we had ever seen before. It let out a roar that echoed through the forest and we both knew it was the last thing we would ever hear. Almost as if some sort of greater being was watching over us. A bear ran into the picture, roaring itself. It seemingly felt, I guess, I don't know, maybe it was feeling challenged by this creature's roar. It tackled the creature and the creature swiped back at it. They began fighting brutally, scratching and mauling at each other. Ultimately, I can't say who won because they began to go out of sight and we took that moment to run and run as fast as we ever have. Luckily, we made it back to the Appalachian Trail. We ran as fast as we could and made it to the nearest conservation building that we could find and met up with some other hikers. We told them our story and got airlifted to a hospital as quickly as possible. We are lucky to survive and to be able to tell this story, but I have no idea what it was that nearly ended our lives that day. I just have to thank Mother Nature and that bear for, I guess, feeling threatened by whatever happened. After I did some research many years after, it did turn out that that was the time that most mother bears would have cubs around, so maybe it was just right time, right place. Fresh out of high school, my friends and I decided to take one last trip together before we all split up to go to college. The Pacific Crest Trail was the destination. A few nights of drinking, hiking and camping was exactly what we needed together. Ian, my boyfriend, picks me up from my house. I've never been to the Pacific Crest Trail, so he tries describing its beauty the best he can. (laughs) Babe, you're gonna love it, I promise. Nothing but fresh air and wilderness. We will be one with nature. I'm not so sure Mother Nature would approve of the ungodly amount of alcohol you have in the cooler. Well, what about this? Ian pulls out a sandwich-sized Ziploc bag of weed. I know Mother Nature would approve of this. She grew it. You've been holding out on me, I said, snatching the bag from his grip. I open it and take a deep breath inhaling the familiar aroma. It's a long ride. Might as well roll one up for the road. Sounds good. I'll call the others and get them to meet us at the location. Ian connects his phone on his Jeep radio, putting on his 80s hair metal playlist. I light the freshly rolled joint, and we settle in for a road trip. We decided to meet up at the Bridge of Gods. The Bridge of the Gods sits at the convergence of the historic Columbia River Highway State Trail, three National Historic Trails, and the Pacific Crest Trail. We walk over the bridge together, being extra careful because there is no shoulder on the narrow bridge, and we must share with cars and trucks. We make it across with no problem and hike for a while until we decide to go off trail to find a spot to set up camp by the river. Three tents between six people, Nova and his girlfriend Tessa, the twins Sadie and Katie, and finally myself and Ian. I sit back with a black cherry white claw and take in the beautiful, beautiful surroundings. The sky let out an orange glow as the sun sank behind the jagged mountains. The mountains came down to meet the cold, untamed river. Nova and Ian began to make a fire before the night came. As the darkness falls, the alcohol flows. The flicker of the flame lights the night. We all reminisce about high school and talk about all that we would like to do for our future. Ian gets quiet and stares off into the darkness that is the river. What's up, Ian? I ask. I think I can see the outline of a boat floating not far off the bank. We all look in that direction. Ian pointed. Yeah, I think I see it too, Katie said. Nova walks over to his backpack and pulls something out. He twirls it in his hand and looks at it for a moment, before putting it in the direction of what we think is the boat. Is that a gun? Put that up, Nova. I spoke. Chill out, Brittany. It's just a flare gun, Ian said as he grabbed my hand to calm me. Nova pulls the trigger, and a trail of light streaks out towards the boat. It lights up the immediate area around the dark outline. It was a boat. Not just our mind playing tricks on us in the dark. Two people stood in the flat bottom boat, looking our way. They wore orange hoodies that hid their face. Oh my god, 
People are watching us, Sadie said. Get the hell out of here, you damn weirdos, Nova shouted. Nova and Ian began picking up rocks on the riverbank and throwing them at the boat. After a few moments, we could hear the engine start and drive away. We finally get over being freaked out. We did our best to put the incident behind us and continued drinking and partying throughout the night before eventually passing out in our tents. I woke the following day to a commotion outside. I unzipped the tent and dragged myself out. The sun hit my eyes and I winced as a sharp pain shot through my head. Drinking obscene amounts of alcohol seems like a great idea until the next day. When you have to wake up with a splitting headache and you get a queasy gut. I see Ian with his hands clasped on top of his head, standing in front of a flat bottom boat and sat on the riverbank on our campsite. Ian, what's wrong? What's going on? I ask. These assholes from last night, they docked our boat here, stole all of our supplies while we were sleeping. Nova walks up behind us. I'm having trouble finding the trail. I have some food and water stashed away in my tent. Let's refuel and go look like a group. After eating, with no supplies, we decided to cut our trip short, pack up, and look for the trail we strayed from to get to this riverbank. Let's split up, Nova said. We can go in pairs of two. Try not to stray too far from the others, so if you find the trail, you can alert the others by yelling. Nova and Tessa enter the woods, Sadie and Katie enter about 20 yards away, and Ian and I do the same. Ian grabs my hand and he leads the way. We say nothing to each other, only the sound of twigs breaking and brush under our feet fill the silence. I think I see something, Ian said. I look around to try and see what he sees, and that's when I notice it. I think we both figure out what it was at the same time by the terrified look we gave each other. To our left, a man in a bright orange hunting hoodie stood several yards away. He didn't move. He just looked at us. A camouflaged ski mask covered his face. He didn't move even when we ran into the opposite direction of him. Even without being chased, we ran as fast as we could, leading to me tripping over some undergrowth and falling. My extended hands were the only thing stopping me from slamming my face into the unforgiving ground. A sharp pain shot through my wrist into my elbow. I let out a yelp in pain. I'm not sure if it's broken, but I know it's at least sprained. The price I had to pay to save my face from colliding with the forest floor. Ian quickly comes to my side, helping me up and inspecting the hand. I held it close to my body. He flexed the wrist, sending a shockwave of pain through my arm, causing me to jerk my hand away. Behind him, I noticed some movement. It was one of the men in the orange hoodie stepping out from behind some trees. I point a shaky finger behind Ian at the man. Ian glances over his shoulder to see what has me so shaken. We'll check this out later. Right now we have to run. Ian grabs my elbow, careful not to touch my hurt wrist. We make a hard left and quickly make our way to what is hopefully the trail we came in on. We break through the trees, but it, it's not the trail. It's a small clearing. It looks like someone has recently been here. A still smoldering fire set in the center of the small clearing. Sadie and Katie break through the brush into the clearing a few feet away from where we came in, followed by Nova and Tessa shortly to the right of where we came in. We all share stories, and they all sound very similar. These men funneled us to this spot, Katie said. Why do they want us here? What, what do they want? Nova responded. Well, you did shoot a flare at them, I say to Nova. The creeps were floating there watching us. What was I supposed to do? Stop fighting. It'll get us nowhere. We need to figure out how to get back to the trail, Sadie interrupted. We looked around the clearing. It was roughly about half the size of an NFL football field. There was nothing out of the ordinary other than the smoldering pile of coals left behind. Let's turn around, together, and enter the woods and search for the trail. It has to be close, Ian said. We began to walk towards the section of woods we had entered the clearing through, and several of the men with orange hoodies and camouflage masks stepped out of the tree line. We turned as a group and began running in the opposite direction. We got halfway to the other side of the clearing before there were more men wearing the same orange hunting hoodies and camouflage masks stepping out. More emerged from the tree line surrounding us. I'm pretty sure there were 12 of them in total. Some of them had rifles in hand. Our group huddles together as it looked like these hunters were slowly closing in around us. 
two hunters grab the twins, Sadie and Katie, and begin to drag them away, kicking and screaming. Ian and Nova run towards the two hunters that grab the twins. Nova throws a punch that connects with the hunter's chin and drops him to the ground. Nova grabs Sadie by the hand to help her up when a loud boom fills the air. The unexpected explosion temporarily disorients me. My ears ring. I look around confused about what just happened and where the explosion came from. I hear Sadie let out a terrified scream. I look to see her coated in blood and Nova lying on the ground beside her. Ian turns around, running away from the scene unfolding before us. The look of fear in his face let me know exactly what had just happened. One of the hunters with a rifle had shot Nova. Ian took about two steps before another shot rang out. Blood spray came out of the side of Ian's head like a lawn sprinkler. Ian drops mid-stride, pulls her into the nearest tree line, and I hush her, violent screams. No additional words are needed as we began to both sprint away from the chaos. I feel terrible about leaving Sadie and Katie to die. But any other action than what I took would have led to all of our deaths. I could hear the hunters scrabbling after us. At least, that's what was running through my mind at that moment. Tessa and I ran full speed for what felt like miles. My legs burned, my lungs hurt, and I would not dare to slow down. To my relief, we stumbled upon the trail. I look around to regain my sense of direction. The bridge is this way, I yelled to Tessa, and we began sprinting again. We ran to the bridge, where we flagged down a car, and they called the emergency number to alert the police. I was frantic, trying to explain to the officer what I saw, that we ran off, leaving our friends to die. Tessa could only weep. She tried to tell her version, but she couldn't get the words out. Tessa was physically shaking, and instead of words, vomit was the only thing that came from her mouth. Several hours had passed and the sun was starting to set when the officers found my friends. The hunters had erected two wooden crosses that Sadie and Katie hung from. Their abdomens sliced open, and the twins were connected by their intestines tied together. Their guts decorated the wooden structure they hung from like a set of gory Christmas lights. Ian and Nova lay at the foot of the crosses. I don't know the reason behind the gruesome slaughter of my friends, but I do know. I'll never revisit the Pacific Crest Trail. I used to go to the mountains every year. Multiple times if fate would allow it. There's something so peaceful about feeling isolated from the rest of the world. I don't have to look down at my phone and worry about bills or keeping up with my friends. For a brief window of time, it's just me and what the world has created. Every year, I would visit the town of Estes and stay overnight so I could grab an early start and avoid as many people as possible. It had gotten to the point where I was recognized and formed friendships with some of the locals. Most anyone working at the diners where I got some fuel before heading up the mountain probably knew who I was. My car and I would traverse the Trail Ridge Road Stopping on the viewpoints along the road, I would observe the wildlife. Rolling green would lay out in front of me, dotted with the remnants of snowfall. I would make sure to stop at every given opportunity and take a few good breaths to slowly acclimate myself to the higher altitude and lower intake of oxygen. That's what I used to do anyways. I haven't been back there in a few years now. I think it was three years ago now that it happened. It's hard to keep track anymore. I try not to think about it too much. I've had issues with the memories popping back up without much cause and sending me into a fit. My chest gets all tight and it's hard to breathe. I swear, whatever happens, I can hear its footsteps. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My therapist that I started seeing following the event told me it might be a good idea to get it out, write it on paper, or tell people my story. So that's what this is. I have no idea if something like this will help, but at this point I'll try anything. I'd love to finish telling my story and be able to get an uninterrupted night's sleep. So, three years ago, like I said, if I ever got the opportunity, I would go back multiple times in a year. And as fate had it, that was such a year. I had a decent chunk of vacation time saved up at work, 
so I decided to take an extra holiday for myself. Everything went about as you'd expect. It was warmer than normal, as I try to go in the quarter months usually. I got into town the same as always. I booked nearly the same room in the same hotel as the last time I visited and threw my stuff into the hotel room. Before heading to bed, I made sure to plot out my intended traveling so I could show someone where I was planning to go. I had been there so many times, and as beautiful as everything was, I liked to try and go off the beaten path when I could. In the event something happened to me, I wanted people to know where I was. That's exactly what I did the next morning. I was greeted by the workers at the local diner and made sure to show them the map, telling them when I expected to return. With enough fuel to get me through most of the day, I headed out. The first place I wanted to go was a decent drive up Trail Ridge Road, Lulu City, a place I was surprised that I had never gotten around to visiting. Pulling onto the side of the road, I sat at the shoulder looking at the elevation between me and the town, a town that had diminished into a small portion of the horizon. Turning the car off and locking it, I was pleasantly surprised to find myself alone on the trail. The fewer people that were around me, the more connected to the environment I could feel. It's like when you watch a movie in the theater. You're so much more immersed when it's quiet. Just a few chattering conversations can taint the entire experience. They say with hindsight, it's much easier to see the red flags. When I think back though, it's hard for me to tell where my first sign to turn back really was. You'll hear a lot of sounds walking through the forest and sounds travel pretty far. So it's hard to say what's unusual and what isn't. Even if you've heard something hundreds of times, it can sound alien. I remember as I was walking the trail, I heard what sounded like several booms from a distant thunder. The noise happened in rapid succession, like the beating of drums, though the weather hadn't called for such noises. At the time, I thought it could have just been the snapping of a nearby tree and the resulting noise of it was smacking into the ground. I ignored it and continued on my path, feeling the mountain air fill my lungs surrounded by trees, all by myself. There was the occasional skittering of wildlife. I even came across a large print in the middle of the trail. I assumed it to be a bear as black bears have been spotted near the trail. It's a nearly four mile hike which isn't all that bad as the elevation didn't climb too much. Around two hours after I had initially set out, I found myself looking at the old sign for Lulu City, an old mining town that had been abandoned in the 1800s. I walked slowly through the place. There were old cabins around the area and various plots of land that once served as foundations for more homes. It was incredible to sit in a ghost town nestled near the Rocky Mountains. It was almost as if the place had pushed them out. From the little research I had done, it seemed like the profit margin for the silver they were mining just wasn't enough to justify the town. Though, knowing what I know now, I can't help but wonder if something else was at play all those years ago. I looked around for a while at the large open area where the town used to sit. There were around 40 cabins at the town's prime. All that remained were the remnants of three, a few building sites in a sign for the town, citing the population was at 200 people. I sat down for a moment, leaning my back against the tree, looking at the area surrounding me, pouring some water down my throat, I watched the tree line. There was this creeping sensation you get when someone is staring at the back of your head. I felt that, but it was like I knew where the feeling was coming from, but I couldn't quite see it. As I was focused on an area of trees where the paranoia was stemming from, I noticed a shadow moving. I had thought at first it was just a dark area where the sun had difficulty getting through. As the shadow shifted, however, it was revealed there was just a dark mass blocking my view. My initial reaction was to just assume the figure was a black bear or an elk, but it was hard to convince myself of that as the shadow reached far too high off the ground. Either way, I just sat and watched. I wasn't about to call any attention to myself, especially if my initial reaction was correct. I had bear mace and the likes, but if I could avoid using it, I would rather do that. 
With the shatter retreating into the woods, I stood slowly from my spot and decided to exit Lulu. As I turned around, I heard a familiar cracking of trees. This time, however, the sound continued for a good minute or two. It was as if the drums of war had been rung and a warning was shooting through the mountain. I wondered if anyone on the other trails were able to hear the noise as it was so loud that it made me cover my own ears. As I started retreating from the noise, it stopped and as I reached the exit to Lulu City, I saw a shadow once more. This time, it was much closer to me. I was able to make out more about it. Part of its dark structure being the antlers atop its head. They weren't the same, jagged and pointy antlers that decorated the indigenous elk around Rocky Mountain. They were more solid, resembling that of a moose's. They were much larger than any pair I'd seen before, though. Large enough to shovel the snow out of the driveway in one go. I backed up a bit, hearing the foliage bending and cracking under my footsteps. I honestly did not know how to approach the situation, because I did not know what I was looking at. The thing was still shaded by the trees, and I couldn't make out its body structure other than it being massive. I wonder how something of that size was able to move so quickly through the trees. Then I caught a glimpse of the eyes it was using to watch me. It was only when shreds of light reflected off of them. The first two shimmering orbs appeared from under its antlers, and then to my shock, another set of lights, fainter than the ones of above them appeared. It was uncanny. Looking at something with such a familiar shape, yet I couldn't decipher what the thing was, or what it wanted from me. I didn't want to keep staring, in case it took direct eye contact as a threat. Averting my gaze, I listened to the creatures stumbling around before the commotion caused by their movements dissipated into the foreground. With the noise of that thing distant, I turned back and saw no sight of the thing. I decided it was best to leave the area quickly and quietly. I thought the thing might consider Lulu City its territory and was giving me a stern warning. I started walking back ready for the easy hike. Watching the dirt path at my feet, I came across a fresh footprint. It was massive. Putting my foot into it revealed that my foot didn't even make up half the size of one of its toes. The thing was massive and heavy. I didn't want to call my trip short, so as I walked the trail back to my car, I thought of just going to the next spot ahead of schedule. I always try to end my visits by looking out over Bear Lake. It's just so pristine, it's hard to ignore. I kept my eyes on the trees the whole time, making sure that some hulking shadow wasn't lurking. Before I knew it, I was exiting the trail and climbing into my car. With a hum, and the vehicle sprang back to life. It wasn't too long before I had gotten to as far as my car would take me before I had to stop and walk the rest of the way. Surprisingly, once again I found myself alone. There were a few other cars where I parked, but once I got to the lake, I didn't see anyone else on the trails. It felt like everyone had been scared off. Bear Lake is normally a pretty popular spot for people visiting. I had the feeling like I was missing something, like everyone else got a memo that I didn't. I sat for a while on a large boulder by the side of the lake, watching the winds ripple small patterns over the smooth surface of the water. It wasn't often you could go there and not hear the howling of screaming children and their parents, so I intended to soak as much of it in as I could. As I sat there, I could see the line of trees on the other side of the lake. The tops of them created an ocean of green that only surrendered to the peaks behind them. I watched that ocean of green sway like a hurricane was sweeping through them. The treetops moved and buckled as I heard familiar smacking noises begin to get louder the realization dawning on me that whatever I had seen before wasn't warning me. It had been following me and continued to do so as I left the site. I had driven there though. I thought it would be impossible for that thing to be able to have made it here so quickly. With the shifting of the treetops getting closer, I slowly rose to my feet when I saw something eject from the top of the trees. It hung in the air for a moment before crashing down into the lake before me. It was brief, but... I saw the object enough to know that the thing had flung a rock l rather large, probably bigger than my body, like it was nothing. I started stepping backward when my ankle rolled on a rock and I fell backward crashing to the ground. My elbow made contact with the hard surface, 
pulling apart the fabric of my sweater and slicing through my skin. Quickly, I opened the small first aid kit I had brought with me, hearing the thunderous noise getting closer. I poured my drinking water onto the wound and wrapped it with a bandage. As I finished tending to the small wound, I noticed that the noise had halted. Slowly ignoring the pain in my ankle and the stinging on my elbow, I looked over the rock to see. The trees were no longer swaying, only moving with a gentle push of the wind. That's when I heard a noise to my right. A huff. Turning slowly, avoiding sudden movements, I saw the beast that had been watching me. I saw it bathed in the sun. Every detail. This thing was some twisted amalgamation. It dwarfed me in size. I could have been twice as tall and still not met it eye to eye. I did not know what I was supposed to do if I was supposed to run or stay still. I watched its pitch black fur ruffle as it took a step towards me, offering another huff out of the bear-shaped nose. Its whole head reminded me of a bear, except for the angular structure around its eyes that looked more like a buck. Four stern and focused eyes, all of varying shades of amber, peered toward me. Its body, again, was reminiscent of a bear that had a bizarre length to it, almost like its belly was dragging against the dirt. If it wasn't for the massive paws pushing down onto the ground, the thing would topple over. It moved its head back and forth, shaking its whole body. Small clicking groans emitted from the open jaw. A jawline with thick and sharp teeth. My reasoning was starting to go out the window, and the urge to just run and get the heck out of there was mounting by the moment. I was backing away and had noticed I was making it back to the trail, but the creature matched my movements. We were both surrounded by trees and the thing started moving its head side to side, smacking its large antlers onto the nearby trees. As it did, the tree's bark ripped free, exposing lighter tones. As close as I was, the smashing of the massive antlers against the trees was like a shotgun going off next to your ear. It caused me to hold my hands over my ears as I tried to back away. I wanted to run, but the moment I put too much pressure on my ankle, I knew I would buckle, so all I could do was continue to back away hopping and just hope that it wouldn't charge. It just kept walking forward, smacking one tree after another like it was trying to intimidate me. I watched amazed as if its large frame bulldozed through the trees like it was nothing. I don't know what I did to upset it more than I already had, but the clicking noise from its mouth picked up and it charged at me. The ground was trembling under the thing's footsteps, and before I had time to process what was happening, an antler made contact with me. The memories get all foggy from there. I remember being shunted to the side, my legs colliding with a tree, and I spun out into the bush. Nearly unconscious, I laid surrounded by dirt and leaves as the bear-like creature approached me. It smelled me, interested particularly in the blood spilling out of my legs where the bones had broken on impact. I got a good look at its eyes before I passed out. One was a set of eyes that you'd expect to see on a mammal, while the others were more lizard-like. Those eyes were the last thing I saw before passing out. It was a miracle I ever made it out of there. Some other visitors had heard the commotion and headed over to find me passed out. They stopped my bleeding and got me to the hospital in Estes. I wish I could go hiking still. I'm not afraid of running into that thing again, but my legs were beyond repair, and I haven't been able to walk ever since. I still think about that creature. I did as much research as I could, but never found anything that looked like that thing. Some monstrous combination of a bear and elk. I wondered if that was the real reason Lulu City was abandoned. Maybe. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't think I'll ever know. Sometimes, I hear the clicking noises it made. Every thunderstorm I hear makes me think about the creature bashing its head into the trees. Maybe it did that as a show of strength, like when bucks smack their antlers together. I don't want to believe that's true, though, because I couldn't imagine what a behemoth like that needs to prove its strength to. What other secrets could the Rocky Mountains contain? Are there more of those things there? 
or perhaps another man or a beast. Every night I go to sleep. I look out my window. I think of those four eyes peering at me through the dark, waiting to finish what they started. I'm not sure if I'll ever feel better having written this all out. Reading it as I go, I almost don't believe it myself. Maybe I'll feel better if I just convince myself nothing ever happened. That I just fell and tumbled hard enough to crack the bones in my legs like twigs. Maybe then, I'll be able to get some sleep. The Haunted House by Stephanie W. Since we moved to our recent house in 2019, we have put religious blessed crosses and other items on every other door. We have also done this with our windows of our home. I've tried my best to set a protection barrier around the house and the land. It helped for a while, but small, unexplainable things started happening. For instance, I was woken up by my spouse telling me to call the cops and asking where our 38 was. There was a man standing in our living room. We knew it wasn't our kids because they weren't home at the time. The alarm, strangely, wasn't going off, so we knew no one had entered the house or the windows. We both decided to go together and search the house, only to come up empty-handed. We have a mirror outside of our bedroom door that you can see our entire living room through. He told me that later something had woken him up, only to see a manly figure standing in our living room. The situation has happened many times, and we never find anyone when we search every single time. My spouse and two daughters have seen a girl around 12 years old in the house at different times. The first time my daughters and I were all standing in the kitchen, when my spouse walked in from work. He walked into our room for whatever reason. I announced to everyone it was time to eat. My oldest daughter had walked out of his sight. He then steps into our oldest daughter's room to tell her to come eat, only to find that she's not there and she comes walking out of another part of the house entirely. The second time both of our daughters were playing in their play area, next thing I knew, both were just screaming, crying, and running into our bedroom, saying they had seen a girl with dark hair walk into one of their rooms. They looked into the room, and there was no one there. The third time, I'm walking to our kitchen to see a girl dash from the kitchen into our laundry room and hear the door slam shut. I turned around and noped the hell out of there. Several hours later, I got back to the kitchen to attempt to wash the dishes, and while standing at the sink, I swear I saw a black figure or mass pass very quickly. As it was passing behind me, I get shoved into the sink. Then it disappears through the wall. I'm standing there in shock. What just happened? Did that actually happen? I run to my kids and practically drag them into my room, locking the door behind me. I don't know why I did that, it's not like it was going to keep that thing out. I call my spouse freaking out, begging him to hurry home as quickly as he can. Since then I have yet to see the girl. Sometimes I can feel the bed sink in at night like someone or something is sitting at the end of our bed. Every time I look there's nothing there. I hear what sounds like footsteps walking and running across our attic. I once tried contacting a paranormal group here in Louisiana, but nothing ever came of it. I supposedly talked to a Native American medium once. She told me that everything happened because of my deceased father, grandfather, and old boyfriend who passed away when I was 19. It's crazy because I woke up from a dead sleep at 4.30 a.m., feeling something wasn't quite right when he died. When I finally did fall back asleep in my dream, my boyfriend at the time had gotten into a wreck, and we were at a hospital. The doctor and nurse kept telling me he was dead, and I wouldn't accept that he was. When I finally woke up, I got a call from one of my excellent friends telling me that everything I had dreamt was actually true. That's just an example of the dreams I have. My gut feelings are spot on almost every time I have them. I'm going to stop here for now. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I have more stories to share if you'd like to hear them. Thanks in advance, Swamp Dweller, if you decide to share my story. The Jim Creep Bye To get this story started, here is a bit of background information about myself. I am a female, 17 years of age. I'm very petite, weighing about 100 pounds and standing at just 5'3". I recently joined my local gym around January 2019 
and have started a routine of when I work out every day, except for Monday, sometime around 6pm usually, and usually I'll stay for about an hour or two depending on the day and how I feel. Anyone who goes to the gym regularly notices others around them and gets familiar with what times and machines are usually available. And if a new person comes, you usually notice them. My point is, is that you get used to these people in the gym with you, whether or not you communicate with them. As a girl who goes to the gym, from my experience, you will get the occasional glance from a weirdo or make awkward eye contact with someone staring at you in the mirror. But all you can do is stare back at them dead in the eyes and give them the nastiest look of disgust. Now, the time that I go to the gym is when everyone usually starts to leave. I am very antisocial and shy, so this works out great for me. Or so I had thought, having some alone time would be excellent. And if something were to happen, they would have cameras everywhere. Now I know this is a stupid way to think. But knowing that you had to have a key card to get into the gym and one to get out was a comfort along with the cameras. For this past month of me doing my workouts, I got this weird vibe from this random guy we will call Randy. As I said, you usually get people looking at you. So it is hard to tell if someone is genuinely a significant threat or just someone being a creep. Either way, both are usually bad, but it's difficult to distinguish the two. I told my mom about this Randy guy because my gut feeling told me something was just wrong and I felt like I needed some advice. She told me we should tell the manager and have them kick him out. But being naive and friendly, I didn't want to kick a guy out just for giving me the creeps. It wasn't a good argument at the time. I started to notice some of the other girls weren't coming as regularly as they would. I brushed this off thinking they had work or were out of town or something. It was really none of my business, but it was something to note. The staff of the gym leaves around 6.30pm and I noticed that Randy was coming in almost precisely when the manager and staff would leave. Again, I didn't really pay too much attention to this because he could have just been a regular person trying to work out at a specific time due to his job or whatever was going on in his life. This was a huge mistake on my end. Here is me trying to reason with myself and rationalize that nothing was going on because I constantly saw Randy, so I considered him one of the regulars, I guess. But this is where the story actually begins. I went to do my daily workout and the manager, let's call her Alyssa, came up and talked to me about other girls who worked out at the same time I did. These girls were complaining about Randy secretly recording them while they worked out. The girls changed their workout schedule due to Randy which explains why I saw fewer and fewer of them. She asked me if I had seen any men holding their phone up to their chest and walking with the camera pointed outwards. I said no until I told Alyssa about this random man Randy, who was starting to creep me out. She said she would look into it and update me on the situation, mainly since I'm underage. The next day, Alyssa talked to me. She said that one of the girls who complained about him pointed him out on the cameras and that she would wait for Randy to come back into the gym, kick him out, and trespass him if he ever came back. She left that night not knowing what had happened because Alyssa was still waiting after I left. I returned to the gym that following Tuesday and Alyssa told me everything that had gone down. She had said that she waited till Randy and his buddy, who we will call Kyle, came to the gym and were parked outside. Alyssa had a friend who was a sheriff. Apparently, he rang up Randy's license plates and, to both of their surprises, he was a registered sex offender and had put on probation recently. Alyssa then found out that Randy didn't even have a keycard, meaning he was not a member of the gym and shouldn't have been using the gym, period. His friend Kyle had a keycard and was letting Randy in. They would work out sometimes and wait for the staff to leave and do creepy things. Alyssa prohibited both of the men entering the gym again and kicked them out. The scary thing is, is that I remember being alone in that gym with those two guys very often. They blended in very well, and I consider them just average workout people. I'm still not sure if Randy or Kyle recorded me, but Alyssa told me she was going to look through the footage and let me know any other news she could, such as them recording me and all that. It is terrifying to think that I got accustomed to these guys regularly being at the gym. I am so thankful that Alyssa kept me informed on the situation. As terrifying as it is, it shows that you should always be aware of what's happening around you and to trust your instincts. It also shows that you never can trust anyone you think you might know. As stupid as it sounds, it's easy to get comfortable with people we see daily even if we don't know who they are. But who knows what might have happened if I caught Randy and Kyle alone again. 
Please be careful at all times. Never judge anyone for good or bad until you actually know them. You never know what might be out there to hurt you. Thank you for your time in reading the story. Mountain Biking Turned Deadly by Luke My name is Luke and I am now 20 years old. This story happened to me when I was 17. This experience still gives me chills to this day. In May 2017 I found myself going out a lot more on my mountain bike. I was getting bored of cruising around the streets, so I wanted to go out for a trail, woodland bike ride. I have never been to Lee Woods before then. Personally, I do not think I will ever go alone again. After some research into different areas, Lee Woods seemed to be the best bet. Living only a couple of miles away was a nice bike ride. On arriving, it looked very peaceful, and I was almost in a dreamlike state by my first look at the place. For a woodland area in England, let alone Bristol, it was amazing. On going into the woods, I remembered seeing different colors at the start of each trail, signifying difficulty for bikers and length for walkers. Don't take my word on that bit, I still have no clue what they mean, honestly. So I decided to go down the blue colored trail to see what was down there. Finding it exciting, I decided to go down the harder trail, and now, here's where it starts to get weird. I began having this weird sort of vision looking around as if I'm being swallowed by the woodland. Everything felt like it was getting bigger and further away. I brushed it off, but it turns out I lost track of time. I got lost in the trail. Now keep in mind I am very observant and aware of my surroundings. I then came to a strange opening. I could go left in the rough direction of the way out or right deeper into the woods. Me being me, I decided to go deeper into the woods. I came to a weird little trail that just had dodgy written all over it, metaphorically speaking. I went against my gut feeling of turning back and went down there. I came to a point of which the trail continued, but it was getting very dangerous. The trail being too bumpy for me to even walk down, I then turned back. But, for a few minutes before turning back, I do not know why, but I was just standing still, staring down the trail. I felt like I was being watched from all angles even though it would be near impossible to have that many eyes surrounding me in that area. I got nervous and began walking back up the hill as I was too tired to ride at this point. Keep in mind, my bike tires are completely solid, with no punctures, slow punctures, or even anything wrong at all. I wish I still had the pictures of the bike. Upon getting back to the spot where I originally went to the trail, that weird loss of time thing began. It felt as if the whole path had stretched by a half a mile, as if the woodland was moving. I begin walking up the path feeling that same eerie sensation of being watched as I did beforehand. This time, it felt a bit more sinister. It felt as if something were about to happen. Bearing in mind, I had not seen a single person now since I went down that first trail. I will explain the scenery before continuing. It is a long path, a slightly steep hill to my left, a narrow river to my right, maybe four feet deep and four feet wide. Bushes are on the other side of the river, with the odd tree every now and then. Upon getting about a quarter of the way up the slowly inclining path, I hear a woman crying behind a tree up ahead. I start slowing down my walking pace to try and get a look behind the tree, but the whole time I am thinking to myself, why oh, would someone jump across to cry behind a tree? So I edge closer to the river to look behind to see if the person is okay. Also because many people go to Lee Woods to commit suicide, so I was hoping that maybe I could help this person. But you guessed it, there is no one there and the crying stopped. A bit weirded out, I just slowly turned away and started walking again, a bit quicker as I was unnerved. I have had a few paranormal experiences before this, but not in a place like this never in the woods. Usually it was in a house or some sort of building. 
so this was new to me. I had this sudden shiver as I was walking, maybe a minute or so later, only a couple of meters away where I heard the crying, it started again, but this time it was opposite of me across the river. I did not bother looking. I started just going again in a bit of a jog. As I got faster, I heard the bushes rustling, as if there was something following me. Upon hearing this, I sped up and the crying became more and more hysterical. Bear in mind, my bike was fine before this moment in time. I have thought to myself, F this, I'm gone. I try to hop on my bike with the adrenaline that was rushing through me, and I come to an almost sudden stop. My back tire on my bike had become completely flat out of nowhere, so I had no other choice but to sprint with my bike and pray for the best, and that I do not trip or end up having to throw it and run faster. With the crying person still close to me and keeping up, I am running faster and faster praying I just get off this path that I was on. I had that feeling of wanting to cry because I could not actually do anything to help the situation or get out of it any faster. And after what felt like an hour, but was probably only five or ten minutes, I could see the car park. The crying had stopped following me and getting closer and started moving back down to where I first heard it. I sprinted out into the car park. I must have been as white as a sheet of paper and hysterical with my breathing and wheezing as multiple people in the car park turned to look at me like I was crazy. I saw the exit sign out of the car park and ran towards it, and, whilst doing so, I noticed my bike to be moving a lot smoother. I could not believe that my bike tire had suddenly regained all of its air. It was solid again, as it was before the unnerving crying person shenanigans. I jumped on my bike and got away from Lee Woods as fast as I could, and have never gone back as... Every person I tell this story becomes more reluctant to go there with me. The thing that makes this story so scary to me is I have Irish heritage. In Irish folklore, there is a demon that we call the Banshee. She is seen in the woodlands next to rivers and lakes washing blood off clothes. It is said that if you see her washing blood off clothes, the person who owns those clothes will die. Alternatively, if you hear her crying, it means death. I cannot remember the meanings exactly of the deaths, but it means either you or a loved one will die. Since 2017, I have lost my auntie, two of my best friends, and a dog. Lee Woods is no joke. There are many stories that have come out of Lee Woods, too. You can read online about them. Search up Lee Woods, L-E-I-G-H. It is rated... 87th most haunted place in the UK according to Higgy Pop. It is a popular spot in Bristol for suicides, or it was at least. Even the ghost of Isambard Kingdom Brunel has been spotted there. Looking over the suspension bridge, which he designed, I may submit some more stories soon, as I have a couple of more experiences I have had over the years. Let me set the scene. It is May of 1977 in a small city known as Albertville, Alabama. The area has just over 21,000 residents and is the largest city in Marshall County. Albertville is included in the greater Huntsville, Decatur area. This area was historically inhabited by the Cherokee people and held many important battles in the American Civil War. Sometime in 1908, one of the deadliest tornadoes in recorded history tore through the small town. This storm practically erased the town from existence. Getting back on track, Albertville was known as a rather safe place with crime rates being relatively low at the time. On the morning of May 15th, 1977, things would change in this allegedly safe community. Two locals were walking near Martling Cemetery and happened to notice something rather strange. They saw what appeared to be a human body. It was male. This body was not normal though. The throat was slashed violently. The torso had been covered in yellow latex paint, and several stab wounds were found on the chest. After all this, the body was then burned severely. Now when I say the throat was slashed, it was cut so severely 
It was described by police as being from ear to ear. Some sort of acidic liquid had been used to burn off the fingerprints of the unidentified man. Soon after the discovery of the body, police began to create reconstructions of what the man possibly looked like to potentially help stir up clues as to their identity. Marshall County investigators publicized a photo of the man, but there never were any matches. After some time passed, the unidentified man was buried in the Arab City Cemetery with a gravestone marked as unidentified. Thirty years later, and the 30th anniversary of the cold case is aired on the local news. Just a few counties over, in Limestone County, a family sees the broadcast and the photo featured and are stricken by how it closely resembles their loved one who went missing in 1977. Dean Kellum is an Athens, Alabama resident who owns a machine shop who thinks the body may be that of his 18-year-old brother who seemingly went missing 30 years ago. Bobby Kellum was just 18 years old when he left for a trip to Talladega with his girlfriend to go watch some races at the track. I am unsure if it was a NASCAR event of some kind or something else entirely. Bobby never returned from his trip though, and according to Dean Kellum, his family just accepted the fact that he was gone. None of them seemed to know what had happened to Bobby, if he was dead or alive, and no one ever reported him as missing even after 30 years of no contact. This part always struck me as a bit odd, and I have noticed several other people online mention the same exact thing. Why would you not report your brother, son, nephew, grandson, whoever he may be, as missing? If he had no prior history of running off and not staying in contact, this should be a cause for concern. I did find an article where Dean mentioned his brother was in some sort of trouble with the law for allegedly writing bad checks. I also found a quote from Dean Kellum, who mentions Bobby's girlfriend contacted him a few weeks after the trip and said Bobby had left her to hitchhike back home and was wondering if he made it back safely. This is one very disturbing detail in my mind. Anyway, decades would pass, and Dean Kellum would say he was 75% sure this man could be his missing brother. He would be quoted as saying, there's a lot of resemblances, you know, in the face and the forehead and all that. After seeing the report on WHNT-TV, he contacted Marshall County officials and gave them a high school yearbook photo of Bobby Kellum. Dean and his mother, Wilma Hicks, agreed to provide DNA samples so authorities could confirm or deny this possibility. The unidentified man's body was dug up from the Arab City Cemetery, where he was buried with just a marker and a date of death. DNA samples were taken from the body and sent in to be tested. At the time, this process could take anywhere from 8 to 10 weeks to get results if tissue samples could be found in the remains. If no tissue could be found though, authorities would have to send the remains to the FBI's laboratory in Quantico, Virginia to be tested using the nuclear DNA identification process. This process can take up to 36 months. In the meantime, former Marshall County Coroner P.T. Williams said he believes the remains are likely that of Bobby Kellum, going as far to say he was 95% sure it was him. Williams was the coroner from 1975 to 1979 and recalls examining the body in 1977 quite vividly. Williams mentioned the way the throat was cut, the man either had to be unconscious or held or tied down with great force. The local police force had a bit of an issue on their hands though. They needed to raise somewhat of $5,000 to get the remains tested. If they could not, it would take up to three years to potentially receive any results from the FBI. Luckily, the community as well as the local businesses around donated $4,000, and the lab agreed to give a $1,000 discount to help the case. On September 21, 2007, Marshall County Sheriff's Department released the identity of the man found murdered 30 years ago. The man was indeed 18-year-old Bobby Kellum. The story behind what happened to Bobby during his final hours of life is largely unknown. I do have some information that I was able to find that could help us better understand what happened. Three people were identified as being involved. 
two of which have died, and one who was terminally ill. No charges were ever pressed, and the case was closed. Bobby Joe Kellum was 18 years old and had just begun work at the Fraternal Order of Police Fair in Anniston, Alabama. He had only worked there from May 2nd to May 14th, where he had met a 17-year-old girl who I have not been able to identify. The two spent a couple of days together and returned to Anniston on May 15th, where they apparently were picked up while walking down Alabama Highway 21 by the girl's father, Dewitt Thrash. A man named Brooks was also in the vehicle with them. The group dropped off the girl at home and told them that they were going to go drop Bobby back off at the highway or bring him home if it was close enough. Once they returned to Marshall County, the group picked up another man by the name of Barnes and drove toward Martling Cemetery. For whatever reason, when they arrived at the cemetery, Dewitt Thrash pulled a knife and cut Bobby's throat. He was likely held down by the other two men. No charges would be given as Thrash and Barnes died in 2005, and Brooke lives out of state and at the time was terminally ill with less than six months to live. Unfortunately, there is only a six-year statute of limitations to anyone involved and prevented any additional charges from being charged against Brooks. The closest thing we have to a motive is from a statement made by Marshall County Sheriff Scott Walls, who said the motive for the murder was likely due to Dewitt Thrash being upset that this man ran off with his 17-year-old daughter. Brooks, who had six months to live, did not want to die without getting this off of his chest. The identity of the girl has never been released due to everyone involved seeing no basis for causing further harm. That last fact slightly bothers me, as apparently the girl had been told by her father many years later about what he had done. Maybe hiding her identity is the best, but I just feel like she should have mentioned this earlier to authorities. And, unfortunately with that, the story of the unidentified remains of a man in Martling Cemetery comes to a close. I don't know what this was. By Anonymous. Hey there, Swamp Dweller. I'd like to start off by saying, while I only have followed your channel for a few months now, probably about two or three, I'm a huge fan of your content. I stumbled across your channel when I was searching through similar videos looking for something to listen to while on the job. While doing so, I spotted your letters from a Cryptid Hunter series, and that started my long journey down a delightful, startling rabbit hole. Excuse my paraphrasing. But anyway, I have a story that happened to me when I was around 13 or 14 years old. I am now 27 years old. I live and have lived in the South Phoenix area of Arizona for my entire life. One night, that will remain burned into my memory until I die though, I will share. I was outside my family home. We don't have a very large property, but it's not necessarily small either. We have roughly a five room, two bathroom house situated in the middle of about a quarter acre of land. Maybe a little less, maybe a little more. I was in the backyard, somewhere between 9 and 11 p.m. playing with my cousins and neighbors when I heard several loud noises and what sounded like a deep, guttural growl come from the alleyway gate. Something I now associate with the sound you might imagine a lion or a tiger to make just before pouncing on its prey. I initially ignored it, as I was having way too much fun. Several hours would go by during which I would occasionally hear that strange sound, and would continue to ignore it while playing. At some point in the night, my nine-year-old cousin wandered off towards the back alley. When I noticed what she was doing, I felt a deep sense of impending doom and dread. I yelled at her to come back to where I was immediately. I was standing there and quickly ran over to her as fast as I could. I started to push her away as quickly as I could. As I did this, back to the gate, I heard some very distinct sound of the chain link fence rattling and shifting around, like someone or something was climbing the fence. I grabbed my cousin's hands and practically dragged her full tilt sprinting back to the light before I turned and saw something distinctly humanoid clamoring over the gate with a cat-like speed and deafness. It hit the ground almost soundlessly 
and then began to pace with its eyes locked on her group. I'll never forget those deep, blood-red, almost sickly purple eyes. They seemed to glow. I'm not sure if they were just reflecting the light or if they were emanating light themselves, but they felt otherworldly, dark, and when I looked into them, I felt one very distinct and forward sensation. Hunger. It was going to kill and eat all of us given the chance. I did the only thing my young mind could think of. I got loud and I got angry. Kind of like you would if a bear was around. I'm not entirely sure what I was thinking. I did a sort of mock charge, taking a few large, overly dramatic steps toward it and screaming at this thing. To my surprise, it seemingly worked. The thing looked back, retreated a few steps, and turned and flew over the gate and scampered down the alleyway. We all ran inside as quickly as we could, practically climbing over each other. I thought for a short moment that that would be my last encounter with whatever that thing was. Sometimes, though, I still see it even today, always around dark and just barely on the edge of my visibility. It's never made an attempt to approach me. It even retreats when I try to approach. It makes no threatening sounds, and it's always in some sort of defensive, low stance. It always has its arms up to its sides. I saw it a few hours ago. It was lurking just beyond the wall that surrounds my backyard, just staring at me. I still have no idea what it is or where it came from, and if I'm being honest, I'm not sure I ever really want to. A Strange Set of Encounters by Brooke F. Hi Swamp Dweller. My name is Brooke. I am a 22-year-old female, and the two short encounters I came to share today are from when I was about 9 or 10 years old. Growing up in rural Virginia was peaceful. Sure, there were foxes, coyotes, bear, deer, and the usual wildlife on the East Coast. Yet, I was never afraid of the animals. Always way more fearful of what we don't know is out there. I've always been in tune with the supernatural, but these encounters terrified me. The first story I would like to share, I was out in our backyard giving our dog some food. We had many dogs at the time as it was a second source of income for my family to sell puppies. Walking down, I noticed my sister walking down into the woods. What was odd is she was on the other side of the fence. Now to get back there, you would have to go up and around our vast front yard, get all the way back to there and then walk down. I had a weird feeling, but I called her to ask what she was doing. I never got a response. Starting to get scared, I ran back into our house only to see my sister was already home in the living room. She was wearing a completely different outfit from the one in the woods. My mom never believed me. Maybe she was scared and didn't want me fretting over it every night, as I was already having trouble sleeping naturally. I eventually let it go, but never forgot. Sometime after, I knew I was in fifth grade at the time at the very least, I had to catch the bus early, and it was rather chilly outside, so I had to put on a jacket as I was fixing my hair in our bathroom. Think of a trailer with an additional bedroom on the backside. It was built off where we originally had a back deck and back door. Naturally, the door was left open as you can't lock it from the inside. The bathroom and bedroom were directly across from each other, and at the end of the hall, maybe five feet to the left was my sister's bedroom. I'm really sorry. I hope that all makes sense. As I was standing in the bathroom, a creature, maybe six or seven feet tall, came out of the bedroom across the hallway. It was lanky. Its skin was sticking to the bone and crawling on all fours with red eyes and sharp teeth. I was absolutely terrified. It stopped and stared at me momentarily before crawling into my still sleeping sister's bedroom. I couldn't move my body and I was entirely in shock. I didn't know what to do. My parents were gone for work for the day, and no one ever believed me anyway. Eventually, I dropped this too, afraid they would hospitalize me for being mentally ill. At this time, I had indeed watched the Supernatural episode about the Wendigo, but never had I thought it was real. However, I think I may have encountered a skimwalker. I have no idea. I remember sketching this thing out one time, and I can still see it in the back of my head. I have no idea what it could have been, but for now... I'm always going to try to be respectful of nature and the things around me. If anybody has any idea of what this thing was, please let me know in the comments. 
Who is the Jenkins County Jane Doe? By Swamp Dweller. Valentine's Day is one of those less relevant, yet somehow busier holidays that many lovers across the globe partake in every single year. I know personally I love showering my loved ones with gifts on this day to show them how much I care. It seems not everyone is as festive as us though. It seems some people have more nefarious and sinister intentions. This story is a tragic and unsolved case from the late 1980s. This is the story of the Jenkins County Jane Doe in the rural South. To begin this story, we need to go back in time to 1988 in the small town of Millen, Georgia. A man and his girlfriend were scouring the area for cans and bottles for money. Not my ideal way to spend Valentine's Day, but you gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. While the man's girlfriend waited in their car, he jumped into a dumpster to find some more cans. Before we go any further, I should mention that days prior to this event, a foul odor was reported around this area. No one had seemingly thought much about it though. As this guy was searching around for cans, he found the source of the wretched smell. This man discovered a duffel bag. He opened the bag with his pocket knife and instantly regretted it. He had made a genuine, gruesome discovery. There were body parts wrapped in plastic stuffed into this duffel bag. The body parts were severely decomposed at this point. At first, the man was shocked and didn't even know what to do with this find. For some reason, his first reaction was to get a friend to come look at the contents to confirm that it was indeed a bag of body parts. This was indeed exactly what it was though, a dismembered, decomposed body of a woman. Who was this poor woman you might ask? This is a true ongoing mystery. Around 4.45 that same day, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, aka the GBI, and the local police were on the scene. Due to Millen being such a small town, the local coroner didn't actually have the experience needed for this crime scene. Since the local facilities were not equipped for this, the autopsy was conducted in Atlanta by a GBI coroner. It was reported that the woman had been in the dumpster since Friday the 12th, two days before she was discovered on Valentine's Day. But reports show she was dead for probably at least four to seven days. There were no apparent signs of injury, but her feet had been bound. Many other tests were run on Jane Doe, and she came back negative for any drug or seminal evidence which would have indeed been left behind if an assault occurred. Unfortunately, no cause of death could be 100% determined, which makes profiling the killer much harder. Rumors do speculate it could have been due to some sort of asphyxiation. No matter how she died though, she is considered to be a murder victim. Since Jane Doe's remains were in such bad shape, the post-mortem photos were never released. At least, I, I couldn't find them anyway. There are two available reconstruction photos of Jane Doe though. The first sketch was made up by GBI forensic artist Marla Lawson in 1988. It was admittedly not to be as detailed as the composite that was later made. The main goal of the composite was to show people what Jane Doe may have looked like. She was estimated to be somewhere between the ages of 16 or 25. She was roughly 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 5 in height and would probably have weighed around 135 to 145 pounds. She was described as having a slim build. She has long, thick brown hair. It might even be black. There is a rather large dispute in her eye color though. Multiple sources report that it's listed as brown. In others, it's listed as unknown. Her dental records have shown that she did have good teeth, her upper teeth were somewhat crooked, and she had recently had a lower wisdom tooth removed not too long before she was killed. The last detail I could find is that Jane Doe's legs were freshly shaven. Another detail that has been up for much speculation and confusion is Jane Doe's race and ethnicity have not been identified. This may seem trivial, but knowing a victim's race and ethnicity can reveal much information about the culprit. Media rumors speculate that she was Asian with the possibility of being mixed, though local talk disputed that fact and assumed she was in fact Latina or Native American. 
Marla Lawson, the GBI forensic artist who created the reconstruction of Jane Doe based on the post-mortem pictures, thought she was of Asian or white descent as well. The stalemate and conflicting details could be a real monkey wrench in the progression of this investigation. Inside the duffel bag, officials found a pillow, bedspread, bed sheets, and a towel alongside the body parts. The pillow and quilt seemed to be from the same matching set. They both had the same rose design. The bed sheets reportedly had no procedures or unique markings. The towel had some sort of butterfly design printed on it. The bedding was eventually linked to a Korean manufacturer. Officials can't be sure, but they think they can link these items to some sort of property that Jane Doe could have potentially owned herself. Now, I did find more details on this case while I was digging around online. I studied deeper into Millen, Georgia and the surrounding areas, specifically in 1988 when this crime occurred. For some context, Millen is a tiny town. Even today, the city boasts just over 3,100 residents. In the 1980s, the town only had just a few hundred more residents sitting at around 3,800 in its prime. The city of Millen at the time had a majority of its population made up of African American families. Asian American families were a tiny minority in Millen at the time. After looking at the historical table of the town's population, you can see that Asian Americans only made up 0.17% of the population. If we look at the Native American population, it was even less at only 0.06% of the people in Millen. So if Jane Doe came from any of these racial backgrounds, then a quick look into the residents at the time who fit those backgrounds could help determine who this girl is. Speculation that does argue against this point, though, is that due to the demographics of the area and that the fact that undocumented migrant workers came through the site seasonally, it is suspected that Jane Doe may not even be from the area at all, actually. It is common for serial offenders to abduct their victims and drop their bodies off in unrelated locations to confuse investigators. More specifically, the dumpster Jane Doe was found in was located off Kaiser Road and Old Perkins Road. Though the original dumpster was taken as evidence, the area has been cleared now to enlarge the road, there are endless speculations on who, where, and why Jane Doe was killed. Something she could have been a part of was this ever-growing human trafficking epidemic that was This was particularly bad at the time, especially for Asian immigrant women who were more vulnerable and easily manipulated. While reading write-ups on this case, I stumbled upon a Reddit post that mentioned that in Georgia at the time, these women came from various nationalities, many were Asian, and exceptionally high number were originally from China. It has been suggested that Jane Doe could have been a victim of human trafficking and could have worked in one of these many illegal massage parlors or spas, which were merely a front for brothels and human trafficking. Some more exciting details noted at the time is that the man who initially found Jane Doe mentioned he saw a small brown car parked nearby. When he returned with his friend, he noted the car was now gone. I was able to find rumblings of additional reports of this alleged small brown car as well, but nothing damning would come of this report. During the interview, the local police were told some interesting information from two children. They said they had been playing near the dumpster when they heard somebody crying out and said it was something mumbled. Something around the lines of, My baby! My baby! At around the same time, they claim a car matching the description of the small brown vehicle pulled up to the dumpster. They described a man and a woman who were both in their 50s somewhere. They got out of the car and proceeded to throw something away. On top of these developments, when police searched the dumpster further, they found a half-full gas can. It isn't apparent if they think this is related, but I figured I'd also throw it in there anyway. We don't have too much to go off of. It is speculated online that the killer probably planned to burn the body. When Jane Doe was discovered, many leads came in from the public. Before I wrap up this case and open up the discussion in the comments with you guys, there are a few leads that have come in. I know earlier that the only known witnesses to this event said they saw an older couple dropping something off in a car similar to one that was reported, but the most significant lead involved a 23-year-old man named Johnny Young. Johnny was a Millen native but lived in New Jersey at the time. 
Johnny was looked into after his friends called the police alluding that they should try to talk to Johnny about the murder. Even more interesting, Johnny's uncle claimed to have seen him with a Puerto Rican woman who he had never seen before but matched Jane Doe's description. Here's where things got even more questionable. Johnny's uncle claims his nephew was involved with two drug smugglers. According to the uncle and a woman who also lived in the community, one of these smugglers was dating this unidentified girl. Johnny had run away with the smuggler's money and the girl. Johnny did admit to knowing one of the smugglers, but not the other one. He also stated he had no idea of some Puerto Rican girl. The GBI could not substantiate any of this evidence, but it is definitely something that we should put out there in the forefront, because it seems like a lot of people are talking about this, and a lot of the information is kind of coinciding with what we know. With our last twist in this case coming in 1991, Deputy Campbell of the Jenkins County Sheriff's Office received a phone call from an anonymous caller in New Jersey. This caller claimed they knew who killed the Jenkins County Jane Doe. The caller referred to Deputy Campbell by his first name and asked, do you remember that girl? And said that he was tired of running. According to this caller, he claimed he had tried to turn himself into the New Jersey police, but they had not believed him. The caller told Deputy Campbell to come pick him up and hung up. Deputy Campbell could never contact that caller again though, but he firmly believes that Johnny Young called him that day. They eventually tracked Johnny down and asked him all about this stuff. But of course, he said he had no idea who made the call and it wasn't him. He relayed the exact same story as the first interview. But he did add in some new details, like how his uncle and another man had shown him the dumpster at some point before Jane Doe had been found. The GBI re-interviewed Johnny's family and friends, but this would of course end up as a dead end. Since this initial lead though, no new information has been developed in this case. Johnny Young, the only suspect we had, died in 2006. So, I guess at this point, we may never know what happened to the Jenkin County Jane Doe. The Poplarville Incident by Madison D. Hello, Swamp Dweller. I recently found your channel about two days ago and I knew I had to submit a story. This happened in 2016 in a small town called Poplarville, Mississippi. My brother and I were out hunting. We live on an immense piece of land known as Indian land. But anyway, on this night we were not expecting to shoot anything just to go scope around. We typically pack on horses, but we decided not to this night. We just didn't want to spook anything. But as we walked closer to our hunting grounds, I started to feel unsure and uneasy. I asked my brother if he felt the same, but he seemingly didn't, so we continued. Sometime about an hour after we made it to the hunting stand, climbed in the air and looked around, hoping to spot something. We spotted two young bucks and a doe, not bad, but then that uneasy feeling came back and all the deer had suddenly scattered, and everything went eerily silent. There was no sound, the wind had stopped, I looked at my brother, and I could tell he was feeling the same thing. Then we heard something moving around in the tree line, and it started to smell ungodly, like somebody had the worst B.O. and garbage ever. It was so bad that my brother literally threw up. We listened for a moment, and then we started hearing movement in the tree line and then we saw it. It was a buck-like creature with a set of antlers, but instead of like skin and stuff, it was just an exposed skull. It looked like it had completely rotted out. The eye sockets were two dark red eyes and they were fixed on my brother and me. The thing was watching us intently and it made an unpleasant smile. As it watched us, my brother and I were frozen in fear, not daring to make a move but my brother unfroze, grabbed his gun, and shot at it twice, hitting it once. This thing let out an unsettling scream, something I have never heard in my lifetime. We heard it run off, so me and my brother scurried down and ran back to our house as fast as we can. We made it to the house out of breath. My brother asked me what the heck I thought that was, and I told him I have read stories of things called the Wendigo. 
My grandmother had also told us about Wendigos as we were growing up, and apparently they roam the land. I don't know if I'll ever see that thing again, but I surely hope I don't. I still feel uneasy from this. The Weird Guy by Far Divide 2510 At the time of this, I was a 15-year-old boy. Keep this in context that I live in a small town in southern Ontario, and crime wasn't very widespread. This happened in February 2022. There was lots of snow this year. I was excited because of the week school break. So, while my younger siblings were at school, I wasn't because I had no exams for COVID canceling them and all that good stuff. So I was sitting at home and I decided that I wanted to go to Tim Hortons since I was craving one of their hot coffees. So I grabbed my earbuds and put on a podcast while I started walking. I believe it was either Swamp Dweller or something along those lines. So I got off my street, which keep in mind is this small road. Hence, I walked onto a longer road which took about 20 minutes to walk down to get to the main street I had to get to. Getting to Main Street, I now had to walk another 20 minutes to get to the Tim Hortons I was going to, so I continued down the road. I wasn't thinking about much, I was kinda just lost in my own head when suddenly a man in his young 20s stopped me about halfway down the road by touching my shoulder, and I was kinda shocked. I took my earbud out and looked at him. He then asked me questions that started innocently like, do you know where a cannabis place is? I said no. They then asked how old I was and I lied, saying I was 16. He then asked me if I had a phone. I said I did, but it was low battery. He asked me if I had a lighter where I was going and if I knew the bus schedule, which I lied about most things, especially where I was going. I just pointed in a direction and saying I was going over there. And then he said, okay, and crossed the street. I was so shocked. I took note of the guy just in case something happened to me. He was in his young 20s. He was wearing a flannel shirt, blue jeans, wearing a backpack, and he was African-American, about 5'10". I kept looking across the street periodically, and there he was, always walking in the same direction as me, following me from the distance, always staring at me with this weird look on his face. I then saw him go near an apartment building, so I thought I overreacted because I couldn't see him anymore. The apartment building was near Tim Hortons, so I went inside and ordered a drink. But before I got my drink, I turned around and the guy was all of a sudden there, staring at me from behind a pillar. I tried to just not freak out. Once he noticed that I saw him, he walked to the bathroom. I grabbed my drink and I walked as fast as possible into a Sobeys nearby so I could lose him. I then took extra measures walking behind a home hardware store and walking farther because I was so scared that I didn't want them to follow me home, know where I lived, or any weird stuff like that. I've listened to way too many scary story podcasts. I went to a no frills nearby so he would never be able to find me. I was very cautious on my way back and looked at all the possibilities that could have happened. I reflected on myself and I only told close friends and family this story. You're probably wondering, why didn't you call the police? Well, that's because I didn't want to cause a problem if I needed to. And this was not necessarily a crime, you know, it's not like it's really against the law to stare at people and freak them out and follow them into establishments. I'm just lucky I got away before it got any worse. Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. Now, with HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to grocery stores and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit and trusted by the swamp for nearly three years straight. It's the most festive time of year and HelloFresh is here to help make the most of every moment. From holiday hosting to dinners during busy weeknights, you can count on HelloFresh to deliver fresh ingredients and seasonal recipes. Tis the season for saving money wherever we can. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. So you can use those savings for holiday gifts or treat yourself. So what are you waiting for? Go to HelloFresh.com Swamped18 and use code Swamped18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. Once again, go to HelloFresh.com Swamped18 and use code Swamped 18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. Join me and many others in the swamp and find out why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. The Fairy Ghost by Sonora 
Later in the evening, sometime around 7.30 one night, a buddy and I were bored, so we decided to go to Knight's Ferry, California. Knight's Ferry is a well-preserved, old small town on a river for tourists to whitewater raft or explore the old bridge and brick buildings, which have bars on all the entrances and windows for obvious reasons. Since it was after dark, the small village was all ours to wander and explore as we pleased. We did this for about an half an hour, our footsteps echoing off the looming dark old brick factories and stores. Finally, my buddy realized he had left his phone in his truck and left me near the old bridge while he went to check it. About ten minutes later, I was starting to wonder where he was, when he suddenly came jogging up to me, pale-faced, looking absolutely terrified. Through his huffing and puffing, he managed to get out that we had to leave because something had spooked the crap out of him. He waited to tell me until we were in his truck and on our way out. He told me that he had seen a shadow in the shape of a man with glowing yellow eyes standing in the doorway of one of the sidebars in the main buildings. He said that when he lit it up with his flashlight, he could see right through it. So of course, I made him turn around so I could check it out. When we got back there, he was absolutely refusing to get out of the truck. So I grabbed his flashlight and went back to the building to check it out alone. I thought I heard a few strange sounds and got chills and an eerie feeling, but unfortunately I didn't see what he saw. I know this is a short, sweet story and it might not be that scary, but we were terrified in the moment, and I still wonder what he saw to this day that made him so scared. This guy's pretty tough and I've never really seen him scared since like that. North Dakota Horror by Andy J. This happened to some of my friends and me during the summer of 2021 after my high school graduation. I'm from a small town in North Dakota, and my buddies and I are the stereotypical rednecks of the city. You know, the type who drive loud trucks and is always armed somehow. We were doing what most teenagers do for fun in the Midwest, driving around and shooting signs. When we got low on ammunition, one of my friends, we'll call him Gary, recommends we check out this snowmobiling warming hut where he's experienced some paranormal activity. Now my buddies and I are all Christians and are very religious, but we couldn't pass up an opportunity like this either because we were also buzzed or because we were just dumb teenagers with nothing to do. So we arrive at the old shack and sit in my other buddies, who we'll call him Larry, F-150 truck. We turn off the headlights and the dash lights and look and listen. Even though I didn't believe in the paranormal at the time and was skeptical, I felt reassured that I had my AK with me. It's important to note that it is hot for a North Dakota evening and extremely dark out. We were all content, feeling good, and someone in the back seat suddenly said it felt like we were being watched. After he said that, I flipped the safety off my AK and tried to be aware as possible. Then he shouted, Holy crap! In the most terrified, helpless voice I'd ever heard come out of him, he tells us to look in Larry's rear view mirror. What I saw was genuinely horrifying. In this rear view mirror, this glowing white figure stands about seven or eight feet tall. It's only about 30 yards away from us peeking behind a tree. Larry immediately turns his truck on and throws it in reverse to get a better look, but just as abruptly as it had appeared, it was instantly gone. I fired a few rounds in its general direction, and immediately after I did, the air got freezing cold. After that, Larry floored it, tearing out of there like the Dukes of Hazard. We were all spooked to our bones, but one of my buddies, we'll call him Barry, says he saw nothing. Now, the white figure was terrifying, but the creepiest part is why Barry didn't see it when all the rest of us did. A Story Impossible to Believe by HorrorFam08. My father has had some terrifying encounters with these entities, but this spine-chilling tale comes from my uncle, a man of faith who walked the fine line between traditional beliefs and his Christian religion. When my father told me this story, I wondered, could it be true? Would this actually happen? That part I'll leave up to you. My father had five brothers my dad being the sixth and the youngest. Stories of witches and the dark side of Navajo beliefs had come from his family, as did my mother's side. My uncle had worked for many churches, usually as a hired hand who could fix almost anything. Everything from cars to the usual maintenance needed in a home. He was the man you needed. 
One summer, while working on the water lines outside of a church, a pastor friend had come looking for him in need of answering a question and in need of some advice. Being a good friend, my uncle said he looked uncomfortable with what he was about to ask. The pastor asked him if he knew anything of skinwalkers. He was taken aback by this question and surprised that this friend would ask such a question. Then, coming to terms with his question, he was never so shocked. Many in his close group of friends sometimes asked what they were. Not trying to be rude, he asked the pastor why he wanted to know such things. The pastor begins to tell him a shocking story that would make anyone wonder if it actually happened. The pastor had become friends with a family on the Navajo reservation for the exact location I will not say. He had become relatively close with his mother and father since these were the first real friends he had made since moving to the reservation. The family was intimate with each other. They had a total of four kids and had an extended family around the area. Their only problem child was their youngest son who sometimes would get in trouble with local law enforcement. At this point, he has gotten involved in a local gang. The father told him this gang was ruthless and at times violent. The family pleaded with the son to leave the gang and hoped he would get away, but to no avail. The son had been with that gang for about a year and had become close with the leader. The leader, the son explained he was a very violent and at times crazy individual, and this made him very feared. The gang members whispered rumors that the leader dabbled in witchcraft rather than skinwalking. Unfazed by this, the son still stayed. Then one night, while hanging out at a member's house, the leader revealed that he did actually practice black magic, and asked the son if he wanted to learn. Telling him yes, he wanted to know, the leader told him to meet at a destination later in the week. When the day came, the son had driven out to where the leader told him to meet. They had met at a cemetery. The son, at this point, was nervous and scared. The leader showed up a few minutes later and they both walked down to the cemetery. Now in this part, I will not explain traditional speaking, it's taboo to explain what went on, but what I will say is that they did horrifying things. The son left the gang, distanced himself from the entire crew, and became a born-again Christian. The son had not made contact with anyone until one night while in a shopping store. The son had not seen anyone from the gang for quite a few months at this point. This night of all nights, he had run into the leader. Shocked, the son tried to ignore him but was cornered by him, and he said the leader was angry with him and told him he betrayed him and that he was going to teach him, sending a cold chill down his spine. The leader told him to watch his back. Wherever he went, he would find him. Terrified, the son had come to the pastor and asked him what he should do. The pastor, somewhat shocked, didn't know what to do but told him to keep faith in his beliefs and everything should be okay. As soon as the pastor was done with the story, my uncle told him to tell the son to seek out traditional spiritual help and take it from there. Months had passed when my uncle asked about the son. The pastor said that he had given his advice and now they were living peacefully outside the reservation. You can believe the story if you want, but take this warning. Don't look for what's in the dark because there is always something out there that will answer back.